we are going to get started. Um, thank you everyone for coming to today's questions. event. Um, thank Free you for ball, those I who guess. had a bomb workout upstairs by Geo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was amazing. Um, so for those who just came to the panel and we usually do a workout and then we come down and then we have a discussion. This is the second event uh, led by In My Shoes. And I'll explain what In My Shoes is all about. But first of all, I would like to begin to thank God. Um, I'm a believer. And without him, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be doing what he called me to do. So first of all, thank, thanks to God for having all of us here today. I would like to thank my family and friends for supporting me um, in this vision and some other vision, you know, my, my dreams, my hopes, my not so great dreams and hopes, but thank you. I appreciate uh, Empower Nutrition, Mimi and Francis for holding this space um, for not only events like this, but for individuals to come. And um, they come for the shakes and tea and they stay for the vibes. So I appreciate you uh, for having this space and in this community, right? Because, you know, as a community, we oftentimes um, don't have sort of positive space or places to go to um, and be ourselves. So thank you for having this space and allowing uh, myself to hold events such as this today and bringing um, people in the community together. I would like to thank the panelists. So. The first event, and I'm gonna pace a lot because that's how I, I do. All right, I, I can't <laughs> sit. It's not in my shoes to sit. So um, I would love to thank the panelists. The first one we did was more about healing journey and it was only female uh, fam uh, panelists because it was March. March is like Women's Month, so we did it in March, it was great. We have a few of the panelists in the crowd, so thank you for being here. But uh, then I went, and this has been my thing for so many years, so I had the pleasure of working with men, um, incarcerated men, and they humbled me so much. And that's where I learned to create space for men, especially black men. Um, I learned through those men a lot about life and how society and our culture don't give a space for these men to share, to feel, to express oftentimes. And oftentimes, the way they learn about feelings and their lives is behind bars, which oftentimes is too late. And so you go through your whole life journey and you know, at your weakest moments, you start to reflect how um, our culture, society, um, paints a picture of men and expectations of men. So I went home and I thought about it. I'm like, mm, I'm gonna have another event. And it's all about men. And uh, that, giving them that space, this space to open up to talk about uh, what's in their shoes, kind of their journey to whether it's fitness, their journey to their careers, mental health, and all aspects of life that creates us as individuals. So I would like to thank you all, gentlemen, for being here, for taking your time to be here, but most importantly, for saying yes and being vulnerable. Because I know that it is so hard to be vulnerable. Me as a woman, it's hard for me to be vulnerable. Um, so I can only imagine what it feels like, and I don't understand, I don't know, because I'm not you guys, but I truly appreciate you all for being here. And I purposely selected different age group, different interests, different hobbies, because I want you all to share those experiences that you go through um, on a daily basis and in life as well. So I truly, truly, truly appreciate you all uh, for being here. And for some of these panelists, this, today's my first time meeting them, actually. Yep. So for some, I was like, wait, I'm just gonna like message this person and ask them, and they're like, sure. So like Danny, for example, my niece was like, oh, you know, MC the Chupa I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, wait, she showed me the TikTok. I was like, yo, this video is so funny. Then he, you know what got me to you is because you posted this um, video about depression and the k culture. 
And I was like, wait, he's trying to send a message. So I want to get him on my soda vent, right? Brandon, I came across this mental health classified thing. I'm like, wait, this young black man is leading this mental health group. We usually don't see that, right? So I was like, okay, let me message him, right? And the other guys in here, I've had some shared experience with Cliff doing mental health stuff. Sean and them, we all met in the gym. All right. <laughs> so um, I had some form of interaction with some of these guys. This Today is my first time actually personally meeting, physically meeting them. So I, I truly appreciate you all for taking your time to be here and just, you know, um, just sharing with the community uh, what you all are about. Um, so moving forward to In My Shoes. Um, in my shoes, I created in my shoes not because of only fitness. When people see me, most of you all in here met me through fitness and think, you know, she's a beast. She's a gym queen, um, always pushing weights. But to me, that aspect is really important. But there is a component to me that a lot of people usually don't see because I don't talk about it is the mental health piece. And so it took me a while to say, what kind of brand do I want to stand for? Because I can easily put a fitness brand out there, right? But that's not only me. So in my shoes, it's meant for everyone because in, in my shoes, right? I walk daily struggles. I walk through daily things that no one else can, right? In your shoes, you walk through daily struggles that I can't relate to. We might go through different um, similar stories, similar traumas, but no one can ever, ever walk in your shoes. No one can feel what you can feel. No one can relate to what you internally relate. So that is what In My Shoes is all about. It's about celebrating your past experience, your current um, experience, and your future experience that you will go through. So on a daily basis, we have to put different shoes on, right? So for some of you are fathers, husbands, right? You do your fitness stuff. So these are different shoes that you have to wear on a daily basis. So I want, I wanted this brand to be more of inclusive and, and just to celebrate people's differences and struggles, but yet overcoming them. So I want to thank you all for being here. We're going to get started, okay? So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Hello, everybody. How we doing? Good. All right. All right. Well, my name is Brandon Texera. Obviously, thank you so much for having us on here. Um, to be a woman of color hosting a group of men who don't want to talk about this kind of stuff on the, the closed doors is big. So um, I'll get started. My name is Brandon Texera. I'm the CEO and founder of Mental Health Declassified. Uh, Mental Health Declassified is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we look to break the stigma on all platforms. So I'll just start a little background of myself. Growing up, I'm Cape Verdean, you know. We don't want to talk about these things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you go go to school, you want to be the funny guy, the athlete, these things. You know, growing up in the society, people always tell you, you can either be an athlete, you're either going to be in jail, or you can be a rapper. You have three things. So obviously, I identified through sports. My whole life was all about basketball, tunnel vision. I'm going to make this happen for my parents. You know, you see Instagram, the cars, the houses. You want to do these things. You want to take your family out the hood, the map, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, growing up, you mask a ton of things that you don't understand. So when I got to high school, I lost my grandmother to breast cancer. That's when I was faced with all these emotions, and I'm just like, what's going on? Why am I crying by myself? Why do I actually feel like I'm just not okay? I'm a man, though. I got a game on Tuesday. I'm the star basketball player. What am I, what am I sad about? So right there, I had the gym. I can go to the gym. I can go get up shots. I'm fine. I've got to talk about it. Funeral, cool. Family, cool. Let's keep pushing. Junior year, I lost my other grandmother. Now I'm just like, all right, back to back. Something's actually sticking with me now. I'm not okay. But guess what? I still have basketball. I still go to the gym, get shots over my friends, mask all these emotions. So now my junior year, I'm getting all my recruits. University of Tampa. I'm pretty much, you know, I'm living the dream right now. I got my recruits coming every game. I'm feeling great. Senior year, my mom gets diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm on a seven-day visit at University of Tampa. At the end of the visit, the coach is like, so what are we going to do? You coming? Back in my mind, my mom diagnosed with breast cancer. I can't leave my mom. So I'm like, I'm not going to come. Didn't tell him why. No explanation. He didn't need to know. 
got back home. My mom beat it. Thank God she's still here yes. today. So I got to live on my dreams, still go to a school. She's like, still go somewhere, still. Because at the time, I was like, I'm going to Massasoit commute every day. I'm still living at home. I'm not losing you. you. I lose you, I lose me. Freshman year, I go to Nichols College. I'm a high recruit at a D3 school now. I'm just grateful to be here, though. But, you know, let's go. Let's get to work. Freshman year, we come in. I do one hill sprints. Felt a little tweak in my left knee. I was like, all right, what's going on? So, you know, you have the best trainers now. You're in college. Go get the MRIs, x-rays, torn ACL. I was like, all right, I'm young. I can get back from this. Nothing's going to stop me. Sophomore year, first scrimmage, my coach was like, all right, let's go. Let me get you back in that starting, starting lineup. First scrimmage, eight, eight for eight from three. I have 30 points now. I'm just rolling. My last shot come down to my right ACL. Right there, I was on the bus ride. We're sitting there. I'm just like, why me? What's going on? Why it's gonna happen to me? Um, but you know, growing up, I've always watched, and it's kind of funny how my life turned into this. I always watched In Inky Johnson. Inky Johnson was a football player who got hurt, paralyzed right arm and hand. And I just grew up every basketball game in high school. I used to watch that video to motivate myself, not knowing that this is my path now, and I gotta take that, take that pain and all that push that everyone invested in me back, invested in you guys for believing in me when I couldn't see it in myself. So sophomore year, I reached out to one of my friends. I was like, she's a pharmacist. And I was like, listen, I'm struggling with this. I'm crying now. I'm, I'm depressed, I think. I don't even know. Like, is, is mental health thing real? Like, are these medications a thing? Is therapy real? She's like, yes, walking me through it. So I finally get an appointment. We all know it takes a long time to get an appointment. So finally, I have an appointment for like May 21st. I come home. It's the summer before my junior year. I'm in rehab. I'm starting my first day at this restaurant in Manly. It's my brother's the manager. And I'm turning, taking a left turn. My friends are coming this way, passing me. It was like God told me to turn around, go say, go say goodbye. I turned around the car, I got out the car, dapped up my friend David. Hey, it was good. He was like, yo, I'm getting recruited by Nichols. I'm going to come take all your shine. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I got to go to work. Peace. 20 minutes later, four of my friends passed away in a car accident. So right there, from grandmother, grandmother, ACL, ACL, four friends. Again, I'm just faced with this. I don't know. I don't know what's going on at the time. I'm just in my own world, in my own head, my own bubble. My mom heard me crying in the shower once, and she's just like, you don't have to cry by yourself. You're fine. Your grandmother's in a better place, you know, and seeing your dad go back to work. Like, that's your mother. He used to go back to work, you know, but that's how they were taught. That's how they were programmed. Come to this country, head down, be a man. You're fine. Make your money. Everything's all right. So when I finally get to therapy, she was like, all right, tell me everything. I was like, yeah, I told my ACLs. She was like, no, what about growing up? I was like, all right, well, then my grandmother passed away, and then my other grandmother passed away, and then my mom. So then all this stuff started coming out, and I was like, I'm playing the sport to be a man. And now I'm, like, uncovering all this stuff about myself that I didn't even know. So right there, she was like, all right, well, you're severe, you have severe anxiety, you're depressed, and you have PTSD. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, what are we going to do? So after my friends passed away, I'm one of those that like, you know, I can't sit my emotions, as I explained, I just had to do something. So I created a memorial for them, the 4K Memorial. There was 2,000 people turning up, we raised 50K for the families to give back. And we did a basketball tournament, flag football tournament, all great stuff, you know? Junior year, come back, I'm not giving up on this basketball thing. <laughs> Gotta try one more time. Um, get on the court and it's muscle memory for me. I catch on the wing, I'm ripping right, I'm going to the lane, it's, it's easy for me. I catch the ball, I take one dribble, and I just froze. Turn over, it's going the other way. It's college basketball, it's not gonna stop for me. They're going down the other way, I just walk off the court. Everything in my body just froze. I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. And that was my first the anxiety attack, my first panic attack. And I was just like, all right, well, I gotta explain this somehow. What happened, Brandon? Ah, a little tweak, that's a lie. I couldn't tell the truth. And so one team meeting, I finally sat up in front of everybody, I was like, listen, this was going on. I don't wanna be here anymore. I'm struggling. So. Junior year, I had to support my team. Senior year, come back. Again, it's hard. You know, you live your whole life, this whole dream. This is where you're supposed to go. I'm going to go to the NBA. Or if not, I'm going to go overseas. I had, like, you know, so many ideas. Senior year, just one day, I go to my coach, and I'm just like, listen, I don't want to be here anymore. He's like, but what do you mean by that? And I was like, in this world, like, there's no purpose for me. So I sit in his office, and just being a man, like, of, of color of himself, he just sat there with me. And we're getting ready for playoffs. Playoffs on Saturday. I'm in his office on Thursday. We have a big practice, and he's worried about me. That's when I was like, all right, this is, this is special. This is real. Um, he was like, all right, let's just try to get through this practice, you know, do what you got to do. 
ended up leaving early, you know. If you know me, I'm funny, I'm smiling, I'm always, you're not gonna know. You're just not gonna know. So he did everything he could, but he's not gonna know. My therapist that day, I met with her before, she did everything she could, but she's just not gonna know, because I can mask it. That's how we grew up, that's how we, you know, survived. That's the, the culture, which doesn't need to be anymore. But, get back to my room, I had a plan, I had a medication, I put it all on my bed, Turn. I went to go turn my phone off, and as I'm swiping on the top, I have all the pills on my belt. Um, my friend from my sophomore year that called me about, you know, just checking in randomly to the pharmacy. She's busy, she doesn't always call. She called, and I was like, why, why? So I picked up the call, she knew something was wrong. That's when I spit the pills out, told her the plan, went to the hospital that night. Um, after being in the hospital, it was just, you know, realizing that everyone in this world is going through something. So I was in a psych ward, I was in there, it was real. There was people yelling, there was people just regular anxiety, there's people with severe anxiety, there's people with all different things. But I got in there and I was just like, all right, I just gotta reset. No phones, no nothing. You have a sheet of paper, you have like five minutes to write down as much numbers as you want. There's some phone walls, you can call, make some calls. I felt like I was in jail, I don't wanna, you know. But I was sitting there calling a few people, but then I realized like, what am I worried about everybody else for? I gotta worry about me. So. I went down the hall, pulled out some cards, pulled a few people together. I was like, yo, let's play some games. <laughs> like, yeah, you struggling with me too. Let's go. <laughs> let's play some Uno. Um, so we got in there. It was just a good experience knowing that you're not alone. Everyone's struggling with something. They just need to open an ear, someone to talk to them, someone to be there. You know, a lot of times you don't feel like you can go to your parents about these things because man up. Yeah. What do you mean? You're struggling. I provided this whole house for you. You got a roof over your head. You got, you got a car, you got this, you got this, but sometimes it's just a little thing. It's attention, it's love. We're kids at heart. Um, so yeah, after being in the hospital, I got out and I was like, I need to start a platform where everyone can come together. So I started that small as a podcast, you know, I get my friends to come on the podcast, he shares his story, someone's gonna hear it, and they're gonna be like, okay, he's sharing, maybe I can go to him in private. They don't gotta come to me, but they're gonna come to somebody. So now we're just gonna open the door for everybody. So we have events, we have paint nights, women empowerment paint nights, we have spoken words, open mics, a bunch of different things, programs. I actually just quit my job on Saturday. I'm going full time now. So we're looking to really just take this to the next level and I greatly appreciate you having me on. Um, but if I could give one piece of advice to anybody, just don't limit your higher up, your higher God, whoever you believe in, to one thing. I limited my whole life to basketball. It was a great journey. I loved it and brought amazing people. But as soon as COVID hit, I was screen printing, making my own shirts. I was making rugs in the basement, doing different, different things, building websites, stuff that I think I could do. I was diagnosed with dyslexia at a young age. Again, they just label a kid because they don't want to deal with him. Now I'm a public speaker. Now I'm writing a book. Now I'm not dyslexic. So, just believe in yourself. And again, I appreciate you. And let's do it. I can't wait for what everyone else has to say. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for the yeah, talking and for your vulnerability. Um, I admire it. Sean Brown, um, first I want to start off by giving praise to my um, higher power um, and give thanks to my Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it is because of him that I stand here before you today. Um, so I always want to be grateful for that. And then second, I want to say thank you to the Queen, um, Candida, for this amazing platform and the space for um, you know kings to have these conversations. Uh, we don't, there's not a lot of platforms for men to come together and, and share their emotions, be vulnerable. Um, I didn't start this journey until seven years ago, and I will get into a little bit about that, but I love the, in my shoes, I, I, I thought about that I, when, when I first saw it, I thought it was connected really to just workouts, but um, then as we started to get to know each other, learned that it was really around the mental health. Um, so when I think about what's in my shoes, I think about a young man who, um, is on a journey of becoming a man. Um, I think about a young man in my shoes as a young man who was raised in a single parent home, was the oldest of four boys, lost his brother to gang violence, um, was gang involved himself, had his first kid at the age of 15. Um, father wasn't in his life or anything, not because he was dead, just chose not to be a part of his life. Um, when my mother told my father that she was pregnant, he said, that's not my child. And I always said that if I ever had kids, my kids would never grow up without a father like I did. Um, so having my first son at the age of 15 turning 16, that became my why. Um, I am a 
lifelong resident of the city of Boston. I'm a product of the Boston public school system. Um, I tell people um, all the time that I went to just about every middle school in the city of Boston before I was kicked out because I was too old and gang affiliated. The story is the same when I got to high school. Um, in high school, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I was a great athlete. I was a great young man, very respectable to my adults, to two adults, and um, I played four years of high school football and I played one year of high school basketball. And I have going to college on a scholarship, a basketball scholarship, and people say, how did you do that? How did you play one year of high school basketball? Well, what happened with basketball is grades always came out and I never had the grades to play basketball, so I was never eligible. Football, all you had to do was pass the previous year to be eligible. So if I failed the first two terms of F's, I passed the third and fourth terms of D's and I went to summer school every year up until my senior year. That was my plan, um, just so I could play football. Thought it worked out for me, right? My dream school that I wanted to go to for college that recruited me was Boston College. Boston College recruited me for basketball and football, but then in my senior year said to me, Sean, we love you as an athlete, but we can't do nothing with you because of your transcript. My transcript for middle school to high school was all of these and apps. When I talk to young people today, and I'm going to get into the work that I do, um, I keep my transcript with me and I share it with young people. I also share my story with young people, not because I wear it, wear it as a badge of honor, but I, wear it hoping, I share it hoping that it can be some sort of motivation and inspiration for our young people to do well. And also understand that your past doesn't define your future. Because growing up, I was told that I'd be three places, two places that were better in jail. Today, I stand here as an executive director of a national organization that I lead across the country. Um, thank you. I hope you see what my organization is and what we do, but just to finish what's in my shoes, and as I talk about my story, um, in my junior year, there was a new basketball coach that came to the school, and folks said, this young man can help your program. You should talk to him and take him out for, for dinner. So he took me out to dinner. He said, Sean, I want you to play for me. He said, but there's a few things that you have to change. Your grades, your friends, and your attitude. That's a lot for, it seems like a small, but that's a lot for a 15, 16 year old, right? So long story short, I didn't, and he cut me. Um, he said there was gonna be a list in the locker room tomorrow morning, if your name is on that list, you made the team. Now I'm one of the best athletes in the school, hands down, football and basketball. I go next day, six o'clock, I go to tryouts, I'm giving everybody the business, I'm on this team, right? I go to next morning, six o'clock, to see if my name's on that list, no Sean Brown. I still go to practice because I'm the man because I got away with football. I got away with things just because I could throw a football. I spent more time in the hallways and in the sub shop, at the sub shop than I did in classroom, but I still passed class classes. So I thought, I thought the same thing was gonna be the same way for basketball. I showed up, coach says to me, he said, I said, if your name wasn't on that list, don't come back. That was the first time that someone stood up to me and made me realize because I was a good athlete that I just wasn't gonna get away with anything. Because prior to that, I did. I passed classes, like I said, because I was a good football player. So that opportunity, I didn't play. That summer, I put my family's life in jeopardy. Um, and it was at that moment that I had a decision to make. I had some words with some kids from a rival gang, which changed words. I had my son and my girlfriend with me, and I don't react because I don't want to put my family's life in jeopardy. I'm praying, God, let me make it through this situation. Long story short, I make it through the situation. I get to the car. Instead of calling my boys, I call coach and say, Coach, I want to, I want, I'm ready to change. And his words to me were, Sean, don't BS me. Um, and he didn't say that. Uh, I said, I'm serious. He said, meet me tomorrow morning at the Charlestown Navy Yard at 6 o'clock in the morning. He had a thing for 6 o'clock, right? But I was there. 6 o'clock, he worked me out every day that summer. Took me to a basketball camp on a college campus. Um, during that week, um, I had an amazing week. The college coach would have his players participate in the camp. I destroyed his point guard. Point guard couldn't guard me and couldn't get the ball over half court. Um, some of you guys are, you know, George has played with me, so he knows my mentality on the court. And I'm pretty sure you can picture what that looked like for that point guard. Uh, so it was tough. End of the week, the coach says, where's Brown? And he said, stand up. He said, that's going to be my point guard of the future. So he was the first college coach to recruit me. Uh, long story short, in my basketball high school career, I ended up going to do a post-grad year at a prep school because I didn't have a lost opportunity to D.C. I only had D3 offers. I'm a Division One player for both football and basketball. I go to a Class A prep school from Hampton Prep, one of the top prep schools in, in the country for basketball. Uh, before I go to New Hampton, have a great year, play the year now, being recruited to all the top schools across the country. Marquette, Duquesne, Indiana, Syracuse, Duke, you name it, they recruited me. I chose to go to that local school that I went to that camp, which was a Division II school, Merrimack College. And the reason was because of my son. My son became my why. And all those other schools were too far away that I didn't want to go to those schools because they were too far away and my son wouldn't be able to, you know, be with me. I wanted to be home where I could be close enough I could get to my son and my family can come be with me. So 
I chose Maryland College, which was a local college. It was two, had a great career there, led the nation in assists my junior year, won championships throughout my four years. I had an opportunity to go play professionally after. I chose to not make that decision because I knew I was going to be marrying my high school sweetheart. What's in my shoes? What's in my shoes is that I am a father of three beautiful children. Um, I am the husband to an amazing wife um, who I have been with for 32 years. We have been married for 20. Um, October this year, we were celebrating 24 years um, of a marriage. Um, and we have three beautiful children. Sean Jr., who is 31, works in the Boston Public School System. Shannon is my middle son who has played Division One basketball, uh, has graduated with his business degree, is finishing his master's, and will go play professionally overseas. Uh, my daughter is our youngest, and she's a sophomore at Howard University. Uh, so when I say what's in my shoes, what's in my shoes is I am a father, I am a husband, I am someone who was told that I would be two places better than jail. And because I believe in the support system, because I believe in a higher power, um, I stand here today as an executive director leading this national organization that's called Youth Guidance. Youth Guidance is a national organization um, that has been around for approximately 100 years. Um, I lead our two school-based counseling programs under Youth Guidance, which is called Becoming a Man, BAM. BAM is a school-based counseling pro program for young boys of color. Um, our focus is on cognitive behavioral therapy, um, reducing violence and increasing graduation rates for black and brown boys. Our programs are evidence-based programs. Um, research has shown by Chicago Crime Lab that our program reduces violence by 50%, increases graduation rates by 20%, and decreases overall crime arrest by 35%. The study has also showed for every dollar invested in our program, there's a $30 return just by keeping that young man out of the system. Uh, so that is been our I also lead our sister program, which is working on womanhood, WOW. And WOW is more clinical. WOW focuses on reducing PTSD, depression, anxiety in young women. Uh, across the country. Same thing, evidence-based program, our research has shown 71% um, of the, I'm sorry, 62% of the queens that come into our program has experienced fewer PTS, PS, PTSD symptoms. 71% of the queens that join our program have fewer depression and anxiety symptoms. Uh, so again, and also 96% of our queens have said that the program has helped them build healthy relationships. Um, so I believe those two school-based programs started in Chicago Boston was the first expansion city outside of Chicago. I'm the founding executive director. Same thing, we have it um, expanded across the country to LA, Kansas City, Dallas, internationally in London, Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh, and there's more cities on the horizon. So I'll put a pin in it there. Um, but again, just wanted to say thank you, Queen, for this amazing opportunity. Um, and, and Brandon, thank you for your vulnerability. And, and, and I look forward to, when we get into some of those questions, talk about how you know mental health has, has served me in my capacity. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> my goodness, we got to talk, all of you, both of you guys. Um, I think this is pretty amazing. I never thought there would be such a platform like this. Um, let me back up. My name is Clifford Bonet. I am the creator and founder of a company named Fight. A little bit about me. My parents, both from Haiti, first generation Haitians here. Anybody have any Haitian friends or been around? Yeah. You know how uh, Haitian people are. You're either doctor, lawyer, or an engineer. Mm -hmm. I'm neither. And I'm the first son. So this was a problem for me growing up. Um, I actually did really well in school, like really well. There was a little school called, um, was it Boston Latin in, Deutsche, in Boston? Yeah. I went there, passed with flying colors. I'm a bird kid. I mean, saw the school and I was scared. I was like, I'm not going here. So my parents said, all right, we'll put, continue putting you in Catholic school. Went to Zavarian Brothers High School. Played with some amazing athletes. But I think at that time I started to get lost because I was one of six other black men in Zavarian. Class of 220 kids, all Caucasian kids. I didn't have any brothers that were ahead of me or any cousins to kind of lead a path or for me to kind of speak to or anything like that. So I had to, I kind of had to figure things out on my own. Again, dad's a uh, physician, practicing physician, owned private practice. He's owned over 30 years, 745 River Street. If anyone needs a doctor, High Park Health Associates, a little plug. Um, 
So I had to figure something out. I remember going to Northeastern, going to biology school, I mean biology class, and saying this is just not for me. When Northeastern says you can graduate, I think five years, because it was a co-op program. But I actually did okay the first two semesters, and they offered like a free program in class, summer school. So I attended, and that was it for me. I said, I'm done, I quit. At that point in time, I decided to venture into being a cool guy or trying to be a cool guy because I was sheltered all my life. I said, I'm going to get out of here, made some new friends, made some really, really bad choices, which I'm going to keep to myself at this time. Um, I don't, and if we could, let's not use the word vulnerability because I think there's a stigma to it. Let's just say our card. So with my program fight, and I'll go back to my story, but my program fight, I say we all have cards that we were dealt with. My father created this quote that says, before any disease, there is a person. I'll say it one more time. Before any disease, there is a person. I'm pretty sure, does anyone know that someone that's been inflicted with some sort of disease, and I know you have, and I appreciate you sharing your story, but I'll give you my, my cards. Green, which is mental health. I have uh, family members that have uh, MS, autism, diabetes, cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, kind of have uh, all of the rainbow. So one day I'm just sitting at the crib and I said to myself, how the heck can I get my father to be proud of me? And I'm just trying to figure it out because I'm helping him out with his practice um, because I used to flip houses and then the economy crashed and I lost a lot of money. So I'm going through that little bit of depression because I was doing really well, but I was like, ah, bubble this. I'm gonna keep making this money. But I'm sitting at the house, and I believe it was, uh, I think September, was it September for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, or is it August? Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. So I'm hanging out the crib, I'm not doing anything, I'm smoking weed, I'm hanging out, and I'm saying, why do they have all these various different companies that are trying to fight various diseases? Why is there not like a Nike of diseases trying to come together, right? So I said, I'm gonna make my own, so I created this little company named Fight. With Fight, all you have to do is change the color of the ribbon and you're fighting for that particular person. You could be a son, a daughter, friend, cousin, niece. You're fighting for that particular person. So I thought it was a genius idea. So I go to my dad, I'm like, hey, this is the idea. And he's like, all right, that's cool. Let's keep working. Damn, I didn't make Pops proud again. Okay, how can I involve this with the business? A little more about me. I'm a content creator. I got married to my wife, best friend, 2017, went to Puerto Rico. Why? Because I wanted to go to Bahamas, but I was afraid that some of my friends didn't have their passports. So I was like, you know what, Cliff, we're not going to mess this up. We're going to go to Puerto Rico. And for those that don't know, and it's okay, Puerto Rico's part of America. All right? Now, go to Puerto Rico. We're hanging out. I'm just still trying to figure things out. I come home, a good friend of mine says, hey, listen, Cliff, what are you doing? I said, I'm hanging out, come to California. Why? I have an opportunity. This is where my life started to change. Shout outs to my boy, Kevin Boston, Kevin Kyle, really good friend of mine. And he brought me onto a production where we created videos for Chris Brown, Tyga, Nicki Minaj, and all these other people. And I'm like, how did I get here? I only press play, so I, I'm not taking any credit or anything like that, but I press play, but I got credits on there. And that's when I started to become a producer, and then my eyes and my mind started to open, and I said, wait a minute, I can incorporate fight with what my father's doing, so what am I going to do? I'm going to create content. This is content. This is sharing stories. A really good friend of mine that I've known for years came to my studio, and he was able to open and share his cards. He shared his stories. When he shared his stories, this was actually the first time that this individual actually admitted what his cards were. That spoke volume and I'm like, holy, I'm not gonna swear, but I'm on the right path. And this is recent. I'm flying by, I'm making, I'm making decent money, making videos, meeting all these different people. But I can honestly say this was probably like a year and a half. So I wanna thank you and you know who you are. I wanna thank you for that. You came into my studio and you shared your story. And because of that, other people started hitting me up and saying, I wanna do the same. I'm 
I'm 50 years old in November, and it took this long. And I'm like, that's, that's kind of crazy, though. But you're right. Like I said, I, I produce content for a lot of people. I work for the jail system. I had to stop probably like a year ago. No, not a year, six months ago. Because going in there and seeing what these brothers are going through is kind of crazy. It started to affect me mentally. I have family members that are incarcerated. I have a friend that I used to be a manager. Still a manager, he's my brother now. He's been incarcerated 15 years. And I can't do anything about it. So I decided I'm gonna use my platform to speak about it, to share it, and say, you know what? It's okay to be sad, it's okay to say, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's okay to, to come to these type of platforms and share this information. Which is why I wanna thank you. Because actually, I, let's talk about your story. I was able to hang out with you for a while because our friend Dom was like, hey, you should interview someone. And I said, sure. And then when you brought up, was it sad? Seasonal? Thank you so much. I have ADD, so I tend to forget things. Um, but she, I said, wow, well, that's something that we should come together and we should talk about on my platform. She said, I'd love it. I said, well, I want to go into your world, which is the, the gym. Went to, uh, to, where we go? Crunch? Wow, you guys, are, there's something special, I'll say. The way they lift, that's something different. But with that, I just found myself intrigued and in saying, if she can do it, no disrespect, I can do it as, as well. So I tried it. Not as many weights is as hard as you do, but I tried. Started hitting, doing the hit gyms, which is, um, which is good. And now we have our follow-up interview, which we're going to book. Um, to finish her interview, but it's part of fight. And again, it's content, and I'm appreciative of that. Recently, my brother and I, who's in the audience, and my father, unfortunately, had to go to Atlanta. A prominent physician by the name of Dr. Gene Nazaire passed away. If you're in the Haitian community, you know Dr. Nazaire, you, maybe your friends, ask him, hey, is Dr. Nazaire, was he your physician? I'm pretty sure he was. So we had to go pay our respect. But this man, the way he carried himself, the, the message is exactly what we're doing here. So I know for a fact that you guys being here is helping us here. And I'm going to be networking with these guys, Sean. We were going to do it anyway, because Dom talked to me about you a long time ago. But I'm just amazed. And again, as I'm a very confident person, but at the same time, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of self-doubt because I'm always questioning things because there's a lot of peaks and valleys when you're kind of just doing the type of work that we're doing. And I salute you for going full time. Like, when he said that, I'm like, this dude's nuts. <laughs> but that's, that's amazing, brother. Like, can we clap it up for that, please? Like, full time? But he, you said, and, and I'm all over the place, as you notice, but I, it's okay, okay. I, I want to go back to what you said during COVID, right? You were like, hey, you started doing screen prints, you started doing this. My brother and I, we, we lost someone. My, my, our brother lost someone. He lost his son due to COVID. And a lot of people was like, yeah, COVID's fake. And I'm like, all right, believe what you want. But I think, believe it or not, respectfully to anyone that might have lost someone during COVID, COVID was a gift and a blessing. And I'll say it like this. I think it opened our eyes and it said, hey, listen, man, it's not just a regular nine to five. We're much more than that. We're forced to believe that, hey, you have to be in this hamster wheel and we have to go to work every day. I'm not saying everyone quit like my man did. I'm not, oh, don't say, okay? What I am saying is that think outside the box. Again, I'm 50 years old. I remember when gas was 89 cents. I remember when you had $7 or $6, you can go to McDonald's and get some food. Now. I bought my kids some McDonald's the other day. It's $55? Yeah. <laughs> Figure out what else is inside of you. Figure out what your card is. Create your content. You don't have to jump on Instagram, but sharing your stories to individuals like us here helps us out. And as a whole, helps our community, regardless of what we are as people. Black, white, Haitian. A lot of Cape Verdeans here. Anyone who's not a Cape Verdean here? <laughs> oh, okay, all right, okay. I thought we'd buy some. You're right, you're right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. But this is what we gotta learn about each other. And this is the stories we have to share. 
So again, I commend you and you and everyone that's coming after me. I can't wait to hear your stories, but this is amazing. Again, we're not being vulnerable here. What are we doing? We are sharing our cards. That's all I ask. And ladies and gentlemen, my name is Cliff Notes P, and these are my notes. Uh, I know I know you fell next, right? But um, King, I wanted to give you. Um, I just want to give some context to you being here, right? Um, one, I believe in. I say all the time, if I have a seat at the table, I'm in the room. I believe in bringing others to the table in the room, right? So this young man uh, I met through the gym, and is someone that I've taken under my wing um, and exposed him to just different opportunities of networking. Like he's a uh, a very intellectual, bright young king with a lot of great ideas. Um, but sometimes he's reluctant to take opportunities like this to share his story and understand. So I know there's some nervousness with him today. He's <laughs> annoying him. So if you want to set the table, and just, let's give this thing. Try to pass me a mic. He has an amazing story. <laughs> so, Gucci King, it's your time. Right. Shine. And what's in your shoes? Yo, there's nobody here. You're here by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, my name is Yvel Florian. Um, at first, I'd like to... Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank Faith, Sean, you know, Dom, for, uh, you know, having me come here. Um, my name is uh, Yvel Florian. Uh, grew up in uh, Newark, New Jersey. I was born and raised came here when I was in 2006. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, backstory of how I was, uh, how I was growing up in uh, New Jersey, in New Jersey. So, you know, growing up in New Jersey was really, really tough, a tough neighborhood. Um, I don't know if you guys know New Jersey, but like Newark, New Jersey was a tough neighborhood. And, you know, mom, dad came, to America in like well, around the 1990s from Haiti, and the culture was a lot different. So, you know, seeing the American culture and Haitian culture was a lot going on growing up in that time. Um, I have an older brother and a sister. Um, my older brother was like, like I can say, he was more like a role model to me. Um, came to America real young, fell into street violence, and it was, it was really hard. It was really hard growing up, you know, seeing my brother in the streets, really smart, good in school. I wasn't really good at school. So seeing that, you know, it really, like, um, took a toll on me. And so what I started, you, um, what I started doing is to help with those those feelings was, you know, dancing and fitness. Um, I remember growing up, my brother gave me a cassette tape. It was a um, Michael Jackson cassette tape. It was like full of like different styles and places that he had been to, and he was training. And I watched that cassette tape over and over again to the like lip pop. I don't know if you know those cassette tapes that you put in. Of course. Slide okay. in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I grew up on that. <laughs> so, you know, growing up, just watching that, watching it, watching it. And I was like, wow, this guy's nice. I want to learn how to dance like him. So I got into, you know, popping and stuff like that growing up when I was young. And then I moved here. And I don't know if you guys ever heard of a, this dance style called crumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Now we uh, gotta show us. Yeah, you <laughs> 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 So, you know, before, of course, before dance and fitness was always, um, I, I've been active all my life since I was a child. But dancing was something different, especially with Crump and Crump, it was something different because just, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of history thing, a history lesson about uh, crumping. Crumping is, it started in the streets. The person who created it, his name was uh, Cesare Rillis. Grew up in Newark, Newark, uh, Newark. Same situation as me. And his goal was to get people that was in the streets to get them out of the gang, gang violence. And 
you utilize the dance to express themselves. So me moving up here, seeing that type of style of dance, I was like, wow, like what is that? It's like these guys are on steroids. The way they, they're moving is different from like popping and, and breaking. So I was like, you know, I want to learn. So I went on YouTube. In that time, YouTube was as, as great as it was today. So I just learned, self-taught myself. And then I came across some kids who were in the block. Um, they were in the gangs too. Most of the guys who, who are crumpers, they are. They were affiliated in gangs too as well. So, you know, got involved with them, learned how to dance, got part of the culture. And it, that right there, learning, I mean, being around those guys helped me to express myself a lot, a lot more as a person because I'm naturally an introvert. You know, I like to just keep to myself. So, but it was a great outlet for me to really express myself in the dance floor. Then, as I got older, started training, being around them, traveling, and, you, uh, and working out, I stumbled across Sean. That helped me a lot too because, you know, it's, it was us two, then it came, became three, then it became four, then more people wanted to train with me and work out with us, and they loved what we was doing. So it gave me some sense of purpose in a way to continue to keep uh, pushing on. So, but yeah, that's, I think, uh, that's a little bit of my backstory. It's not too much, but yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. How's everybody doing today? Mm -hmm. My name is George. Um, George Dutton, a lot of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I want to thank God. First, um, something I'm really um, it's new to me. I'm starting to do this all the time now. Um, I wake up in the morning, I'm praying, um, and I'm just grateful. Um, I want to thank Candida um, for giving me an opportunity to sit with all of you guys, and I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you guys for coming out and listening and um, showing that someone does care. Um, I want to thank Sean Brown. This is going to be weird, and he might not remember this, but um, I believe in signs, and um, I tell kids all the time, pay attention to the signs, pay attention to the signs. And he'll tell you I was a hothead when I was younger. And I can remember I played on a basketball team um, he was a part of, and I was the youngest one on the team, and I didn't understand that because I was the youngest one that it wasn't my turn. Um, I took that hothead side and was like, fuck, F this. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, at the time I didn't realize it, but now, I mean, I, like I said, I've been talking to God, and, and, and he's been telling me the people that I've been around are the people I'm supposed to have in my life. And Sean called me one day, and this had to be maybe 12 years ago. And he was like, man, what's going on? You weren't here. You, you had a commitment, this and that. And at the time, I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, y'all didn't play me, I'm leaving. I know my value. And I didn't at the time. I really didn't know my value. I thought I was more than I was. And that played a toll in everything that I'm going to explain to you now. Um, so I just want to thank you for reaching out to me at the time, even though I didn't understand why. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I grew up in Brockton. Um, went to Brockton High School. Didn't, I mean, I went to Brockton High School, and I didn't go to Brockton High School. I might have went for like 180 days out of four years. Um, so I didn't graduate. Um, but I went to college. Uh, got an ex extraordinary story. I went to college. I played basketball, I got a scholarship. Um, I came home one summer and I broke my hand. And once I broke my hand, I didn't go back to school, it put me in a dark place. Started hanging out with the wrong crowd, um, turned to the streets, started making money, and then became a slave to it. That was my every day. Every single morning I woke up, picked up my phone, hopped in my car, and that's what I did every day, all day, nothing else, until I went to jail. And my first time in jail, it was in the federal penitentiary. <laughs> I didn't go to any of these little places around here. The feds came, they pulled me over and I was confused, like what the hell, well, who am I? Like what are you coming to get me for? And like you have a federal warrant. So that's where everything started with my mental health journey. I was away from family, I was locked up, I was young, I didn't know what I was doing, and 
I remember going in for sentencing. I mean, I copped the plea. I was in the feds. You don't get to fight mm -hmm. them. They got you. They got you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I go into sentencing, and the DA's reading my charges and everything and reading the whole sentencing memorandum, and they were going to give me eight and a half years in jail. That was what my guidelines came back to. That's what the time I was supposed to do while I was in jail. And I got another blessing. My judge looked at me and said, like, I'm looking at your backstory, and I'm looking at the paper, and you don't match the paper. Yeah. And she said, I'm, I'm going to give you two and a half years, which made time served. Right. Wow. The time I sat in there. I literally went back to jail for like eight days, and I was released. And I was home, and I was just grateful, and I was like, okay. But that's when the real battle started. I'm back home. I'm a felon now. What am I going to do? Right? I got people telling me, you got to work here. You got to do this. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle for stuff that I don't want. So I started training basketball by myself, doing basketball trainings. Got into a job. Um, my lawyer actually got me hooked up at the Dana Browns Basketball Club now, where I'm the director. Um, started there, um, it was rocky at first, and then all of a sudden a parent from, my, my, one of the kids went home and said, oh my coach is great, he played basketball here, so the parent Googled me. <laughs> so yeah, Googled me and then all of a sudden I get a phone call, I'm, I'm actually, so I actually took a vacation, I was happy, I was working, I was doing the right thing, I went on vacation, and I was in Cape Verde. I'm not Cape Verdean, but I was in Cape Verde. <laughs> um, I went on vacation and my lawyer called me and was like, I'm not gonna wait until you get back, you need to know now. And I'm like, what? And he's like, you're, you don't have a job anymore. Mm. And I'm like, all right, this isn't gonna mess up my vacation, I'm gonna party and have fun and whatever. So I get back, um, I go into my old job and I sit down with the guy who owns it. And he's like, listen, this came out, we can't have this. And my response was, you know what, I'm not embarrassed about my past. My past has shaped me and it doesn't define me. So, okay, if I have to take a step back, I'm gonna take a step back. This is when another blessing happened. I left and got a phone call a week later and he said, you know what, screw anybody that doesn't want you here. If they don't want you here, then they don't need to be here. I'm gonna not only hire you back, but I'm gonna put you on salary full time. That's my journey, man. It's like, you don't give up. Um, I've been there now for seven years. Um, I'm the director of basketball training operations there now. Um, I just started my own brand. I have my own nonprofit. So that's all I'm, I got to say is like, don't give up. Like, everybody's journey is hard. Everybody has a different path. And nobody's journey is harder than anyone else's. It's, it's your journey and how you deal with it. All right? So thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure how to follow up all that. Uh, that's, that's wild. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all these men um, for being here, for sharing your card, uh, as my man said, um, because it's not an easy thing to do, right? Um, I think society has failed not only men, women, all of us, right, in terms of how we view not only ourselves, but how we view the world, right? Um, so to be in this space with other men sharing our stories, um, our struggles, is big. And I want to give a big shout out to Candida because it took a woman to organize this, right? It took a woman to get a bunch of men together to speak on, on this topic. So my name is Danny. Um, some of you may know me as Danny V. Um, not sure how I got here, but I'm here. Um, you know, I'm a content creator. Most of my content uh, revolves around comedy, um, specifically uh, about my Cape Verdean culture, um, but I do like to incorporate a lot of social issues into my comedy. Um, for example, Candida mentioned it earlier. Um, I have a, a video about how Cape Verdean parents deal with uh, depression, right? And I, and I do it in a comical way, but it opens up conversations that I'm really grateful about. Um, so a little bit about me, as I said, my name is Danny. Um, I'm 30, I won't say the rest, something, 30 something years old. Um, Came to the States when I was five. I was born in Cape Verde. Um, and, and as you can imagine, 
that was obviously a struggle coming to this new country for my parents, um, trying to figure this whole new world out, right? Um, I'm the youngest of 10. Daddy was busy. Daddy was a rolling stone. So I'm the youngest of 10, um, you know, and I see my older siblings go through a lot. Uh, my older brother specifically, he was heavy in the streets, actually ended up getting deported. Um, he's still in Cape Verde. And, you know, obviously I looked up to my older brother, wanted to be like him, wanted to get into the streets at one point. But when I, when I saw what that did to our family, I was like, all right, I got to, you know, do things a little different. So um, just trying to navigate the world as a young man has always been tough, especially when, you know, you have parents that have morals and values from a different world coming into this new world that has a whole different set of rules and uh, morals and values and things like that. So, you know, um, I did pretty well in school. I went to West Bridgewater High because my parents did not want me to go to Brockton High. Um, I'm a lifelong Brockton resident, but I ended up at West Bridgewater High. I did really well there. Um, I always say that there's more cows in that town than people. Um, so everybody knew each other. You know, they really focused on the students. So I did really well. Went to college, went to Bridgewater State. Realized really quick that wasn't for me. So uh, my second year, I decided, yeah, I'm out and kind of got into the uh, into work, into the uh, into the field, and just been navigating life ever since, and been through a whole lot of things. And I just want to say thank God we don't look like what we've been through, right? Um, and I'm a believer. I believe that I'm here right now because of God. Um, and everything that I've gone through has been because of my faith um, and that I've, you know, I, I saw the other side of everything that I've been through. So um, I'm just grateful to be here, grateful to be amongst these men right here, um, sharing their stories. And I just want to give a shout out to all of y'all for being here, right? Um, you see a lot of faces in here, women, men, um, a lot of different people here, and, and that's a blessing, you know, because we don't see this in our community. So I'm grateful for Candida, I'm grateful for the space, I'm grateful for all of y'all, and I'm just looking forward to everything we're going to discuss. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Francois, um, co-owner of Empower Nutrition, and I just want to say, just like anybody said, like, thank you, Candida, for just, you know, bringing this amazing, amazing panel, like, you know, for, to um, everybody out here. To so all y'all kings, thank you very much for being in our space and also, like, you know, for sharing your cards. Um, thank you very much. So uh, a little bit of my story. Um, as I said, my name is Francois. Uh, I'm a believer, father, friend, teammate, uh, entrepreneur as well. Uh, my wife and I, thank you, Mimi. Thank you, my love. So we own um, we own Empower Nutrition. We own the martial arts upstairs. We own the Empower Fitness upstairs. So if you got a chance, you can go upstairs and just visit our martial arts and our fitness studio that we have upstairs. So personally, I might not relate to most of y'all, and I think that's the beauty of it. I am not from here. I'm from Senegal, West Africa. I'm not, I don't even have 10 years yet in this country, and I think that's the beauty of it. Right? So I have a lot of things still that I'm unlearning, and I'm learning. So I'm unlearning a couple things, and I'm learning new things that I kind of like, you know, that I would probably relate to some of y'all. So when I first came here, so just back home, back, um, I had my master's in finance. Um, I was an auditor over there. I had a great life. So it has to, for my wife to come visit Senegal. So that, you know, we fall in love. So she was supposed to come stay in Senegal, live with us. But the thing is, she doesn't speak French, she doesn't speak Wolof. And back home over there in Senegal. Oh, by the way, Senegal is 45 minutes away from Cape Verde, for people who doesn't know. Yes, sir. All right, so the yeah. really people are our neighbors. Yeah. Right. yeah. So the, the plan was for her to come to live in Senegal, but she doesn't speak French, she doesn't speak Wolof. So, and for me, like, I was a little bit okay with English because, you know, American, okay, who doesn't want to go to the U.S.? So I was very comfortable in, in Senegal. I was not stressing about nothing. I never thought about like what's the other meal or the next meal will come from. I don't know that. I don't know that. Thank God to my to my parents who are still around. I'm so grateful for them. They they kind of yes, they took care of us, of all my brothers and our siblings. I, I don't I don't know anything about like stress until I came in here in the United States. So when I came in here, really quick. And I came in here really quick, so um, I was waiting for my papers, you know, and I'm like, okay, like, what every, when is it going to come? Like, the working permit, because they stages, working permit, green card, uh, before you have the citizenship. So I was just waiting. The waiting was just crazy. And my wife was like, hey, why don't you want to try, like, you know, going to, to the gym? So she introduced me to uh, kickboxing, 
I didn't like it. The first class I tore up, I'm like, I'm not going to be doing something that I'm going to be throwing up on the set. Thank you. <laughs> so, so good enough. So on the gym owner, Eddie Bishop, he was like, hey, why don't you want to try the jujitsu, the jujitsu program upstairs? I'm like, okay, sure. What is it? I didn't want to know nothing about jujitsu, nothing whatsoever. He was like, just give it a try. So I gave it a try, and I, and I liked it. And the pastor, who's, uh, who's an amazing guy, his name is Pastor Mike. He's a black belt. And he made me feel like a world champion. He made me feel like a world champion, literally like, like a world champion. And since like, since nine years, I've been practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And literally like not two months, not a couple of weeks ago, I won a, one of the biggest championships in the United States. Like I won this 100% submission rate, which is, which is kind of crazy for some people just to think about what I'm about to say, 100% submission rate. And to the level that I'm doing right now, it's not really given to anybody to say it. But for us, I'm like, all right, whatever. So, I right, whatever. So coming here really quick, just waiting for my papers, starting this martial art journey. I was just waiting for my papers, getting my papers. I was introduced to a new world. I got to work now. So back home, I was good. I had an office. I had my car. When I was dating her, like, you know, I was good. But beside my friends, I was good. I had my car. I had my house. Well, not my house. I was still living with my parents. But I had my car. I was good. I was very comfortable. But coming here, looking for a job was interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. So I was hoping to get into like, you know, office just like I uh, left back home. But no, I started working in a warehouse, in a freezer. I did it all. Unloading containers, I did it. And I was really good at it. I was really good at it. People were always looking at me like, yo, bro, chill. Like, you know, take your time. Like, you know, you don't have to rush this. I don't know that. You know what I'm saying? So... And I was just like doing it. So it, it took one of the, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Urban League. It's a nonprofit in Boston. I'm so grateful for what you guys are doing. The nonprofit that you guys are like, you know, creating right now are giving opportunities to someone who's coming next. Maybe you are not aware of it, but it took Urban League to help me, gave me the opportunity that I have with my finance background that I have back home to implement that. So I was at Urban League for two months. I did like two month program. Out of 20 people, they were supposed to take 10 people. So I was looking and fortunate enough by the grace of God to be part of those 10 people. So the goal is to go to State Street. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the investment bank. Mm -hmm. um, to go to State Street for an internship of six months. Then out of those six months, they just guarantee you an internship. Now after the internship, it's up to you to get hired or not. But for me, from the get-go, I talked to my manager, hey, listen, I'm not here for the internship. I'm here to get a job and to, uh, to get hired really quick. So I was really good with Excel. So I just did a couple of macros left and right, and they look at me as a genius. So trust me, I, I just Googled it. I YouTube it, and I swear to God, <laughs> I YouTube it. I, I became really good at it and really good at explaining it. They look at me, I'm like, yo, bro, who's this guy? <laughs> so I, from that year, I got the Rising Star Awards from the whole company, like the new beginners, whatever. So I'm like, all right, I got promoted to A2, and from there, from the financial reporting, and um, I just jumped around on the thing. So now I'm working for Bank of New York Mellon, still helping my wife in the entire nutrition, running the martial arts school, and um, the fitness area as well. And also, just all to say that like we all have potential. So for me, like working for my feelings, it start showing up when my wife and I we lost our, our baby. I didn't know how to react to it. I don't know stress, guys. Like I don't know that. So I didn't know how to talk about like me losing someone. So it took for like 12 months not talking about it. But my wife was very comfortable about talking about it. She did therapy. I was looking at her, all right, that's your thing. I didn't believe in it. I don't know nothing about therapy. But now I'm using jujitsu as my therapy because if I'm in jujitsu, I'm like blocking out everything. It's just helping me, he's just resetting me in a way that like I can't even explain. But I'm still learning how to talk about a loss of my child. I don't know how to communicate. I don't know how to talk about it. Like it's just there is a fire deep inside who's still burning. I'm still trying to heal from it. I don't know how to talk about it. I'm still, I'm still learning. And guys, when we lost our child, uh, for you guys understanding, I don't have no parents whatsoever beside me in this family. I'm the only one here from my family side. My closest family member, that's my cousin who lives in, 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 um, in Canada. And the other one lives in Seattle. And she's my cousin. And we, you know, in Africa, everybody's a family member. You know? Yeah, so. So I don't have nobody to talk to when we lost our, our child. Nobody. When I say nobody, 
nobody besides WhatsApp. But WhatsApp, you can really share your feelings through WhatsApp. You can really share your feelings. So I don't. I, I do not. I didn't know how to communicate, how to share my feelings. It was really hard, really heavy, and I think some way, maybe I'm becoming kind of a little bit okay with jujitsu. Is because I'm funneling some of my feelings through my martial arts. Maybe I'm having wins left and right here. I'm very, becoming good. Like I, maybe I'm just saying maybe I'm still learning. I'm still healing, and I'm hoping through through this um this panel I'll be like healing. I'll be learning more about myself, and we all are gonna grow from it. Thank you very much. Guys. Wow. 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 That's a lot to take in. Um, I, this, the, 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 the crazy thing is, I've talked to all of these guys, but never got into their stories or deeper. Sean and I connect a little bit about mental health, um, a little because of his job and my passion uh, for working with women, but wow. Like, wow. Like, you guys just inspired me. I, 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 just, I just put this thing together and just put it. Yeah. It was just like, okay, let's do this. Let's talk about feelings. But I appreciate you all for sharing. Like, you, you, you all don't understand and have no idea what impact you just created in my own life and my view. And I hold such a respect um, for all of you. So, like... I always say everything happens for a reason, and I think this this was God's work because I just I just scrambled it. I was like, let me let me do this like I'm baking or something. And look yeah. look where we are. We created something really powerful. Um, so now I'm gonna ask questions. I did uh, write some questions down. So now and the you know the audience, you feel you feel free to you know share uh, ask questions as well. But before we go, I think you all touch base on little topics that we're gonna cover. But I just wanted to read some stats, and I should have done that in the beginning. So the suicide rate amongst Black youth has actually tripled within a decade. A decade is ten years. COVID was one of the years that it actually was heavy, and that that rate tripled, meaning ten to 17 years old. Wow. We're not even talking about the 25 to late 30s, because actually in my experience working with um, men, a lot of their mental health, like when they start to recognize it, starts in the teen, like 20s to the 30s. Actually, the rate of suicide, the highest rate of suicide in, in age is like 25 to 35 for men. So within between 2017 to 2024, it has tripled. And that's where I have this passion to work with men because of all the things you guys talked about that we as community, society, even household, don't talk about, don't acknowledge. Because men do suffer in silence a lot. And they're more likely to end their lives because it's a lethal woman it's more likely we pre-planning. There's a lot of more things that goes into it, so our rate of survival is actually greater versus men, it's lethal, it's guns, it's hanging and such. So um, so I wanted to read that stat. The other one is black men are five times more likely to get incarcerated. And that's where I had my aha moment when I worked at one of the jail for three years. I still go back there and do some work. And that's where I led the group full of men. And that's where I learned to humble myself as a woman, a black woman, and doing work with black men. I had a uh, one inmate who was a gang affiliated from 12, 11 years old, with, from E, and he was 35. They put me to just work with him. And they're like, okay, get it. you got him, you're strong. You can shake my arm, you can you need the guidance. And I'm like, oh no. He was going to feds. But he was waiting for his sentence to go to federal prison. And they're like, just work with him. PTSD. From eight years old, witnessing someone getting shot, getting involved in gang. And from then I worked with him and I was like, okay, 
Let's make a goal for you to not spend any time in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is 24 hours where they lock you up due to fights or whatever happens in the jail. You don't see anyone, and that's where a lot of people's mental health actually gets impacted. So I usually go into the solitary confinements, talk to them, chat with them. So I was like, okay. What was your longest time getting out of like solitary confinement? He's like, I don't know, like in a week, a day. I either suck a bunch of people, I get into fights, I just like to be by myself. I said, okay, that's the goal. We're going to work on not getting there. I worked with this guy for almost two years. We're doing some cognitive behavioral therapy. I work with him every week. We see each other. I give him assignments to write. I do that. He does it. He's, he didn't like it. He's like, who the hell do you think you are? Uh, you're giving me to talk about my feelings. So he started to write. And then when it came up to almost a year and he was going up to Fed, I remember I, I said, do you recognize that you haven't gone to solitary confinement? He goes, what do you mean? I was like, you've been on a regular unit for almost six to one year, and you didn't get any disciplinary sanction. You did not fight. He goes, holy shit, I'm going to curse. <laughs> holy shit, this is the longest I've ever been in general population in jail. I've always been locked up. And for him, that moment, he didn't realize it, but for him, that was like one of the biggest goals. And working with this young man, he told me his only fear was to die because he started to change and he actually wanted to change. So those are the experiences that, this is why I held this panel because those experiences shape me as an individual, as a person, and I hold a space for men as well. It's, and I know society, culture, we talk a lot of negative stuff, but those are the experiences that actually help me reflect. They could be my brother, they could be my family member, they could be my friends. And only if we had the guidance, only if we had the space to allow these young men to share, then they could have been saved in some ways. So I wanted to read that stat. The other one is one in six men gets experienced abuse in their lifetime. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Okay. And we don't talk about that. That's a silent thing that we just don't talk about. Domestic mm -hmm. violence, sexual abuse. I've worked with survivors as well, men. And as a woman, doing that work with men is challenging. But these are the stats that I want you to really keep in the back of your mind. And at times, we see men and their behaviors and the way we cope is more they violently, right? It's more aggression, anger. Anger is our one thing that we go to. Like for me too, like I grew up not seeing my dad cry. Well, I saw my dad cry once and that was because I was hurt. That was it in my whole life. So I do hold a really, truly a deep space for all of you in here and I truly appreciate you all for taking this time to share what's in your shoes, <laughs> all right? So we're gonna get into the little questions and feel free to, um, you know, share the mic and piggyback on each other. Um, I like my questions. I like to, you know, just ask. So the first question is, what are some ways women can hold space for male figures in their lives to feel I'm not going to use the word vulnerability, but to feel more comfortable and open enough to share their struggles with mental health and wellness. Anyone? 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 SB. <laughs> no, SB. SB. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Um, and, and what immediately comes to mind for me, um, I start to think about conversations that me and my wife have had um, for years. My wife, one, I think it starts with the, the man. It starts with you know being able to um, have the willingness to share with a woman and, and believe that um, there's a trust there that won't be broken or you won't feel betrayed. Um, and I go back to the experience with my wife. Uh, my wife used to always say, uh, for those who join the room, um, me and my wife been together for 32 years, married for 24, right? And she used to always say that I'm her best friend, uh, and I couldn't connect to that for years. Uh, I couldn't connect to it because of the way I was raised. Uh, I tell people that my life was built on a bunch of lies. The men that I thought were teaching me how to become men, um, 
you know, weren't men themselves, but that's all they knew, so I couldn't blame them. It wasn't until seven years ago when I started this journey of ruthless self-examination and dealing with all my trauma and pain and baggage, going back to that 10-year-old boy um, and dealing with that daddy wound. Um, so when my wife would say that I'm her best friend, all I had in my mind was my uncles who and, and folks who raised me coming up and said, young man, don't ever put your hands in the life of a woman because they'll F you. Um, I saw my uncles coming to my, my, my mother's house with trash bags of clothes because they had just been put out by a woman um, and said, don't trust a woman. So for me, I internalized that. So when it's about sharing my cards, um, I was reluctant to, um, and I couldn't connect to that. But when I did this work seven years ago and went away on this Mankind Weekend where it was a three-day retreat, just cut off from everything in the woods, and you had to deal with all your trauma, baggage, and pain. I dealt with that and what that was about for me. I went back to that 10-year-old boy, the uh, boy of my father not being in my life, and getting to the root of that. I dealt with the, the, the murder of my brother, which I never, for years, I suppressed, but I dealt with that um, in that space, and then just really dealt with the trauma around the infidelity and things that was happening with me and my wife. So one of the first pe person that I had to come back home to and have a conversation with was my wife and said, I get it, I apologize. Um, and I was able to then have those conversations and be comfortable with sharing what I was going through, um, sharing that these this has been my experience, that my wife used to say to me that you need you need help, you need therapy. And I used to say to Mark, I don't need therapy, I'm not crazy. I don't know if I'm good. I didn't, and then I didn't see therapy. And it wasn't until that weekend that I came back and I said, I get it now. And I started to see a therapist and I started to have those conversations. We went to couple therapy together. Um, and I'm happy to say that my wife is my best friend. My wife is my best friend. And I mean that I talk to my wife about everything and I feel comfortable in having those conversations. She has helped me get through um, situations that I've dealt with in life for years that I just, like I said, suppressed. And, and so having someone who, that I can trust, that I can look at and know that they're being transparent with me, uh, that they're holding my my stuff um, and not using it against me. So that's also part of it is, you know, being able to have someone you can trust and don't feel like it's being used against you, that is going to come up. Because we do have bad days. Again, 32 years, I'm not gonna tell you it's all been roses. Um, but I, I feel comfortable now that I don't have to worry about something that I shared with my wife coming up to backfire on me or to hurt me intentionally and things of that nature. So having, being able to, you know, communicate with a woman and feel like you can you can trust that person. So I think transparency, trust is very, very important and it has to be receptive and open, so. Yeah. You were better off dropping the mic after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear, I see a lot of like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. like that trust. Okay, can we, can we further go into that? Yes, yes, all right, let's go. Yeah, so I agree with Sean, I think trust is a big thing for all of us, but specifically for men, um, because it it builds um, a layer of comfortability, right? And we are more, I hate to say it, vulnerable uh, when we are comfortable, right? So I think trust is a big thing, but I think also to break the mold that society has created that men can't cry, right? Um, I think we need to trust in the women in our lives that it's okay for us to cry, yes. right? It's okay for us to open up and be emotional, right? Um, and when I said earlier that society has failed us as men, that's one of the things I'm talking about. You know, this, this idea that women are more emotional than men, which I don't buy into that. I think we are all capable of expressing our emotions the same, men and women. But we've given women the role of being the more emotional one, and men, you know, we have to be tough guys, right? Uh, which I think you can be masculine and vulnerable at the same time, right? Um, they can coexist. So I think for, for the women in our lives, it's really about, like Sean said, trust one, and two, just giving us the space to be open and emotional, and maybe reminding us every once in a while, like, hey, what's going on in your life that you might wanna talk about? Because a lot of times, we won't share we don't share when we're when we're asked about it, let alone when we're not asked, right? But I think if we are asked, it it kind of opens that up a little bit. So yeah. Just to piggyback off of what everyone's saying here, I think it's fear, the fear of opening up and saying something and then having that like a tennis match hit that right back to your face. Yes. 
or months later, bringing that back up when we thought, hey, we were done talking about it. And I understand there's some healing that still needs to be done, but I think there needs to be a, a maybe a, a better, a productive way of continuing to heal as opposed to just saying, you did this, you did that, or you don't understand that. Um, and maybe women, maybe you have to be the stronger person in this time for whatever that situation may be. Maybe it's not us. Maybe we can't go that far. And I'll use my personal experience. I, uh, I have a, a few people that I know that are incarcerated and I can't do the phone call thing. A lot of people are gonna look at me real funny. I can't do it. I support through other ways simply because I can't continue to entertain the do you remember when conversations or we're doing this conversation when I know that it's not realistic what they're talking about. And I think women in, this, in my life should understand that component by saying, okay, I get it. You can't be strong for that part. Maybe this is something you are struggling with. Um, you can't be quote unquote the man on this one. Um, and I think that's all we're looking for. I believe we're, a lot of people here are believers of a higher power instead of saying God. Because I think when, once we place a label, that's when we become separate. We, we get separated, which is unfortunate. I do believe in God. And if you do believe in God and do believe in the story, women was created for men for, with our rib. We're the same. So let's all treat each other the same. Same feelings. Same emotions. Same vulnerabilities. Same cards. But I hate the rhetoric, especially with social media, saying you're not a real man if you don't. You're not a real man if you. That's the part that I think you had hit, that society has failed. And I think it gets to be compounded with social media. I know you guys, you guys, everybody has social media, right? Remember that, uh, what was it, um, the restaurant piece when it was like, I'm not bringing someone to, uh, what is it, the Cheesecake Factory, a real man? No. I'm like, man, my, my wife loves the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? What are we talking about? But the real man component is the part that I think having that thrown in the face. And another note and card I'd like to share with you guys is remove the ego. I think it's the ego, right? The evil E. I call it the evil E. Once you can remove that evil E, conversations can be had. You can feel that we're all on a level playing field, right? So let's all remove the evil E. Let's not throw it back. And that goes for men too, you know? Um, infidelity, let's talk about that. If that happens, don't throw it back at them. And don't throw it back at us. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, just want to add one thing to what I mentioned earlier in terms of the strategy. Um, one of the strategies, so our program, Becoming a Man, is built around a set of six core values. Integrity, accountability, positive bank expression, self-determination, respect for women, other visionary goal settings, right? And one of the goals of that, of those, of, of our organization is to have our young people internalize those core values and practice them not only in school, but in the real world, right? But that expectation is the same for my staff. That expectation is the same for me as executive director. I tell people that I don't work a day in my life because I love doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, so for me, one of the strategies for our young men is we create a safe space for young men to be, you know, express what's in their cards. Um, vulnerability, right? Uh, but for me, the conversation and the practice with my wife is, um, and, and what, we, what, what I have, taught my sons and my daughter is to do a check-in uh, where it's not one-sided. You know, a check-in where both you and your partner get to be vulnerability. What does a check-in look like? How are you feeling? You know, for us, it's a pies check-in. And what a pies check-in in BAM is, how are you feeling physically? Um, where are you at intellectually? What's that top of mind for you? How are you feeling emotionally? What are you connected to spiritually? Um, and that allows for that, that safe space for when you're sharing um, with your partner or whoever um, to both be in that space. So the vulnerability is happening both ways. Um, the sharing of, of expressions, feelings, and things that may drive them both ways. So for me, you know, my check-in might be physically I'm feeling good. I went to the gym every day. That might look different for my wife who didn't have an opportunity to get to the gym. So she's feeling a certain way. Think about intellectually. Intellectually, what I'm thinking about, I got a board meeting coming up. That's what I'm thinking about. 
her intellect can be on something totally different that she's thinking about, right? But if we're on different waves and, and that can show up some way in the house and then create friction between if I'm not on the same page. Emotionally, how we feel and being connected to what my emotions are for that week, she knows uh, what is hers. So we're aware, and then spiritually, what are we connected to? Um, are we connected to God? Are we connected to our young people? So just having those type of check-ins allow for you to gauge where you are, where your partner is, and that's something that allows us to be in a good week um, a good space to know, okay, this is what this might be. It's, this is what might be happening or going on with me or my wife instead of assuming and not having those conversations. So just, you know, strategies like that and, and really being intentional on how you can create those safe spaces uh, for you and your partner to have those conversations, to talk about, to share those experiences and, and express. And then like you said, being transparent, being transparent about what the rules of engagements are when we're doing this uh, so no one violates that. That's great. So this one is going to be a long one. Uh, you may hear her, uh, you may hear, or you have heard the word within the community. I am a brother's keeper. How many of us heard that, or pledged by that, or talked about that? Which touches upon accountability, like you said, Sean, protection and identity between male bond, um, be it friendship, family, or brotherhood. What ways do you support and hold? the males in your life accountable for their mental health and well-being. This is anyone. <laughs> um, for me, starting my platform was for my boys in general. <clears throat> that was to basically show them like Cause before I went to the hospital, my best friend, I'm gonna call him out because I'm, I'm gonna send this to him after. <laughs> but my best friend, Elijah Rue, D1 basketball player at Canisius, he called me. We grew up, I grew up with Elijah, best basketball player I've seen. And I was just like, when he called me, I was like, I don't wanna do this anymore. I don't wanna play basketball. I hate this sport. I've always hated it. I just did it because my parents loved it. I was good at it, so I had to do it. So I was just like, all right, this new show is. I hate it too. <laughs> so like, I hate it too. I happen to identify through this sport. I just want to be regular. I want to be a person and, you know, more than an athlete. Um, so definitely creating my platform, the podcast, was for my boys to hear and know that, you know, we're all, you know, we, we're brothers, we're brothers keeper. We love each other so much, but we don't have these conversations. So what are we really doing? You know, we're just chilling in the basement, shooting the shits and this regular stuff. Like, that's not cutting. You know, 2K is not cutting it no more. We got to talk because... When I go home at night, I'm by myself. Yeah, I can call my boy whenever, but am I gonna be my mind that night? Mm -hmm. The mind's the strongest thing we have. Mm -hmm. So, doing that, and just recently, you know, checking in the group chat, like, challenging them, all right? January just passed. What's one thing that we accomplished, and what's one thing we wanna look forward to in the year? February, and I actually missed last month. That's my <laughs> Got me. But, I gotta just check it in like that, because um, I hold myself accountable too and just knowing that where we're at um, with each other and stuff. So when we're hanging out, it's like, yo, if we're playing 2K, I know something really is going on though, you know. We'll be fourth quarter, I'm, I'm gonna be beating you, but I'm gonna be like, yo, talk to me real quick. But, um, so just opening that space for your boys and you know, being vulnerable, but uh, showing your colors. I have a question, what if you don't have, what if you have really close friends that don't move like that? I don't, I'm not blessed like that. I have one, and my cousin who recently had a new baby in December, lost his wife two weeks later. Preeclampsia, crazy. But he's the only one that I can open with, but three hours difference, believe it or not, that's huge. But like my brother who's here, he's not here anymore. He's just starting to open up a little bit. My middle brother, he lost his son. He doesn't really open as much. But all my other people, with, I mean, if at a drop of a dime, if we needed anything, we could do it. But when it comes to this type of combo, it's just, it doesn't happen. They happen all be Haitian, but I don't know if that's a thing. But like, we don't, we're, when I tell you we're close, these were all my best men in my wedding. These type of conversations don't exist. So. If y'all got a secret sauce or code, I'd appreciate it because I, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm the same way. I don't really, 
I, I grew up without a father, so I don't really have any male figure that I talk to or even friends. Like, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, I honestly cope with it myself. I talk to myself. When I'm going through things, I mean, I use the gym as my outlet. I get in the gym, I'll be on the stair master, and people look at me sometimes like I'm crazy because I'm just speaking. But I'm getting everything out. Everything I'm going through, I'm getting it out. I'm talking about it. I'm putting it out there to get it out of my mind. And it works for me. Don't you want some answers, though? I, all my answers are in, up there in my face. I got to hear something for me. All like this here, y'all don't get it. This here... I appreciate all of y'all listening, you talking. I'm like, damn, I, that's why I, I hope you give me that content like I was asking, because I want to go back and actually say, oh, try this, especially with my wife. The, you know, the rules of engagement, I believe you said. Um, I think that's major. Um, my brother left a little early, so I hope he takes something away within, he applies it, and him and I can have that conversation, so. Ashe, King, uh, I'm connected to you and George uh, when you say, if not having the space, because the spaces were there, I just weren't, I wasn't aware of who was in those spaces and what was happening until I had, so quick story, after I came back from that weekend, um, they tell you on that weekend, after that weekend, don't make any rush decisions for the next six months, right? They tell you that, I'm like, what does that mean? Okay, for me, it didn't hit me until two years later that experience of everything that happened that since because I opened up Pandora's box for lack of a better words, a bunch of emotions and things that I was never connected to. So I thought I was going crazy. Um, and this is when I'm gonna get into the mental health piece for me. When you know you talk about when did you realize your mental health journey? So after that week and two years later, uh, started seeing therapy, started all these emotions and feelings bubbling, bubbling, and I thought I was going crazy. And that's when my wife was like, You should talk to someone. Uh, I'm like, I don't need to talk. And she's like, talk to your mentor. I went to my mentor and I told him what I was going through and just shared my experience. He says to me, Sean, you're in a room with some of the brightest people just in the world, locally and across the country. He said, you'll be amazed how many people are going through the same thing you're going through. You're not alone. And he said, go talk to this person. So one, he shared his story with me, which is my mentor who, when I, you know, when I talk about where I am today, I tell him every opportunity that I get that I love him and I owe him for helping me become the man that I am today. And his thing to me is you don't owe me anything, do what I did for you for someone else. That's so that's pay, pay it forward. So that's why I dedicated my life to making a difference in the lives of young men. So when I graduated from college, I started my own nonprofit mentoring organization. Uh, you know, so again, he said, shared his story with me. Go talk to this person. When I talked to my next mentor, he shared his, so for me it was like, wow, I would never imagine that these kings are going through the same experience that I am. So that began to create now a circle for me of men who I look up to that are in the same kind of work and guys that I just respect and admire. And we started again to have these conversations. They started to challenge me. And then from there, um, I'm gonna ask, if you're here today because I invited you, raise your hand. Okay, that's important for me. Important for me is who am I bringing here so they can see this and now we create that bond and they create that bond. He said to me, and why I did the intro with you, Val, is because uh, I know how challenging it is for him to speak. So I know his story because he shared it with me, but it's important for him to know that you are a true expert in your own experience, King. What are you nervous and, and ashamed about when this is your story? This is your story, so share it. And you never know because we hear it all the time online, people connecting with us saying, wow, you don't know how much you inspired me. You never know who your next event. When you share that story, who then is gonna have the same experience that you had and be like, wow, now I gotta go talk to somebody. So for me, it was having two kings that I met through him that now I mentor and say, young kings, let's get in this room and learn about mental health and how do we connect because we're building relationships. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for us, brothers, because what's important for me is not what happens today, what happens when we leave here. Do we stay connected? Do we need Ken Dina to make one of these opportunities, the next one for us to get together? Yeah. Or do we, amongst each other, say, you know what, bros, let's connect in a month, whether that's Zoom or do whatever, for us to build that brotherhood so you have that space. And I know you and I, and I want to give Dom, uh, you know, some props because I met Dom in the gym, um, and again, I was on my own journey. The gym became a mental health you know, piece for me. Uh, I spent hours of the day just working. How do I take care of myself? Just getting in the gym for three hours and I'm just, I'm doing me. And I met this man and I remember seeing him in the gym and his commitment. And I said, I feel like I hit a wall, King. I watch you, is there anything you could you know, give me? And then we built a relationship. Uh, you know, From there, so I dedicate 
you know, my growth in terms of the gym and things of that nature, and then I pour into Dom as well around some of the mental health. We have conversations, like, so that's a relationship that I build. I get connected to this queen, so that's what it's about. That's how we, it's up to us. What are we gonna do after this is over? What are we going to do? There's a responsibility now, a call of action for us. How do we continue to pour each other so you and George have an opportunity to connect with us? Like, listen, Sean, this is just something I'm going through. Let's talk about it. And for me, it's not about giving you advice. It's about being in the air. It's about listening. And when the time's right, you're going to show up. You're going to talk. And I'm always just going to reach out. And like, King, I'm just checking on you. Don't need a response. Hope your day is going well. Um, God bless you, so forth and so on. So. So just on going back to the brothers keeper, I have a question for you, but I'm coming right back at you, Me? right? Yes. Oh, okay. So um, Sean, thank you very much for bringing him out here, just, you know, to get him out here. But just hearing your story, like, you know, how you grew up from New Jersey, how, like, you know, it was very interesting and probably, like, I would learn more from it. But, like, a um, couple of weeks ago, La Sonia, sorry for putting on the spot right here, she kind of checked me out, really, because for me, the way I, I'm keeping out like my brother, so if I say I'm a brother keeper for you, I'm going to keep it real. I'm gonna keep it real raw. And sometimes the way I do it probably is not really good. And she checked me out, be like, Francois, you gotta be careful the way you say, it because if you come at me like twice, three times, I'm gonna tell you, okay, bro, you need to quit. Stop it. I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it to you raw, maybe the ugliest way possible. That's how I am. And she kinda checked me out, be like, no, 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 you gotta be careful. Because we have like history of people putting us down. So you need to wait, you need to find a way to better say, and my question to you, like, how would you like someone to be a brother skipper to you? Oh, man. Damn. <laughs> 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 oh, man, I don't... Huh? I mean... I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I do got a lot of uh, brothers. You know, I got, you know, brothers in the church. You know, I got some of my brothers here. Um, and I also got um, guys like uh, Dom and um, Sean. You know, I got guys who I come to talk to about my my problems. And I also have guys who I talk to when I'm in the gym. And then I have guys who I talk to, you know, outside the gym. So I think I have mentors in different parts of what I do in my life. And that's what helps me now. You know, just because uh, me being an introvert, actually being around these people it's the people that are kind of helping me um improve more in my life so that's pretty much it i love your question king and here's why right because it's connected to for for me when you're describing that it's connected to my shadow like we all have a shadow whether you know it or not you have a shadow um and what's really important is to keep that shadow in front of you so it doesn't trip you up because when it gets behind you it's not so for me you're talking about accountability partner mm -hmm. you know being able, and i got to be okay with knowing that when my shadow is showing up that i got brothers who are going to hold me accountable go and say listen sean is that you or is your shadow present mm -hmm. and being receptive to knowing okay you're right this king knows me and he's calling it and not take it defensive so for me it's about the accountability partner it's about you know one we, we've all heard the saying hurt people hurt people right mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and for me, I say it all the time, and, and one of the things that makes my heart hurt um, is we have a lot of hurt people who have been charged with healing and dealing with our young people and they haven't taken care of their stuff yet. That's men and women, right? So we got to take care of our stuff before we can then look at young people and say we want to help them get their lives right. So for me, when I hire folks, I'm hiring someone who's willing to do ruthless, ruthless helps them, ruthless ruthless self-examination that means look in the mirror own your stuff and understand that we all have baggage we all have baggage with us there is no perfect so when i hire our, our counselors are called wild counselors and bam counselors right i'm not looking for the perfect bam counselor wild counselor i know it doesn't exist i'm looking for someone who's willing to do that work who's willing to own their shadow and own their shit and say this is mine and be able to have that conversation. Candida, are you on, you know, what is this about for you today? And can you have that conversation without being defensive and say, you know what, you're right, and then we can move. And Candida, Candida can do the same thing for me, is to be able to have that healthy dialogue. So King, thank you for that. And for me, that's what I try to model for these young kings. I try to challenge Gucci to be more, again, you know, 
more receptive to being challenged and getting out there and things of that nature to have those tough conversations because there's also a lot of history stuff that he has to deal with mm -hmm. uh, pertaining to you know childhood and, and culture okay. and things of that nature. Uh, but only he can do that work and until he's ready, that's when the breakthrough will really happen. Um, and he's getting there, but it's on his time. Um, so. All right. Well, these questions are getting deep and deep. Um, I have more questions, but I appreciate all of you. Does the audience have any questions? Does anyone have questions? I'm going to take a break. I think I'm, I'm going to put my questions on hold. <laughs> Hi. I want to say thank you so much for you guys being here. This is definitely a learning experience. I'm a mother of two boys, and this for me is very important to hear you guys because that's something that I... I want to pass on, but my question is, and in, in as because I am a single mom, um, how important is fatherhood in mental health for young kids? You know, and how as single mothers can like not necessarily replace, but how can we do that part for them? Well, that's else. I got to respond. I'm going to let someone else talk. I got to respond. Come on. Let's go. Hey, let's see a little bit. Here you go. Fathers. Fathers. Not, not a father. Not, all right. I, I'm a father, but I'll, I'll take it from a different perspective. So my wife was, I'll say, a single mother for a period of time. And her boys are my boys. I don't like, I don't like that term, step stepson. So they're my sons, right? So... Thank you. But we have two of our own that we share together, and I can tell and see the difference. I would say to you, to answer your question, that it's, this is the scary part. It is extremely important to me. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a biological father. It just needs to be a true man that's willing to admit when they are wrong, when they are, for them to listen. So it's something that you would have to identify. But what's that term? It takes a village. Yes. A man, that village thing is for real. My, my wife and, 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 and myself, we're here for our kids. But I use the examples of other children. For example, we know of um, a family that has three girls and they're all going to college. They've, two of them graduated from college. Amazing examples. And they serve uh, as an ex uh, amazing example for my daughter, constantly. Every year, every quarter, I call them and I say, I thank you for who you are because what your actions and what you're doing serve so much for my daughter to learn. Because again, social media is saying, hey, you can do this. And the same for my son. Now, I'm struggling with my son because I'm trying to get him to do the basketball thing. I sent him to Dana Barrow, so that's coming soon. Because I'm like, hey, Dad had a couple moves. You're not listening to me. <laughs> but I found out that he will listen to others. But obviously, you need to vet who it is that they're listening to, right? Definitely got to vet them. And my children understand that if these group of men that they're speaking to are not in my circle, that's probably not someone that dad is going to say, hey, you want to listen to. So to answer your question again, I think it is important. I think you more than likely have those individuals. And I think you can utilize social media as a, as a Band-Aid until you really identified someone. Um, someone like this gentleman here, he has, he has some stories. I think everybody on this panel, to be honest with you, um, I think that's amazing. So. Um, I wish you luck in your journey because I know I need luck too. Um, yeah. I'll kind of give a different perspective. Um, going up for me, I had my dad in the picture, but he wasn't like present because he was just working the full time mm. as a Cambodian man. He's just head down, let's work, let's work, let me make this money. So, yeah, I'm playing basketball, I'm getting high all the night, shot me in the shoes. And, but as a kid, I'm not thinking about where this money coming from, but they're just superheroes that mm. providing, they're amazing. Um, so him not maybe going to like two basketball games out of my whole life was like, all right, he doesn't like me. F him, F that. I was telling my mom all the time, he doesn't like me. I don't care for him. Um, because he would work Monday through Friday, 5 to 11.30. We're in bed at 8, we're going to school, whatever. I only see him on the weekends. On the weekends, I have AAU games. I'm never seeing him. So it was that kind of thing. So for me growing up, it was more so 
my coaches, my coaches I looked up to. Those are the people that are holding me accountable. Um, so I would say if any like sports or anything, like mentors really, um, have a conversation with them. I know my mom talked to my AU coach and for like hours. He was like, I want Brent to be my starting point guard. I was like, I was, I was like next to my mom, like, I want to be a point guard. <laughs> I want to be a shooting guard. Let me just catch and shoot. Like I had bad anxiety. I didn't even know at the time. Um, but she talked to him for hours. Like, listen, I need you to hold him accountable. I need you to do this. Like there's going to be times I can't pick him up at this time. Take him. And that's when kind of my boy's parents, they, they became the father figures, my coaches, all these different people. I got like 17 fathers now. You know, all people I can go to at any given time. Um, and COVID allowed me to actually sit down with my father and learn this man. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, you, just, you just don't know how to talk, though. <laughs> hey, but, but I love him. So, but I'm definitely just pouring in. And if there's a mentor or a coach or something, like call him. Be like, listen, you got my kids for the X amount of hours. Like after school, they're releasing through this sport or whatever. Really try to sit down with them. Like, you know, some kids just need that extra love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, I think about me and my mother's relationship when I think about, I mean, because make no bones, uh, my father wasn't in my life, but my mother raised me and she did a hell of a job. Um, yes. You know, and when every, anyone asks me where I get my mental toughness from, I think I need to tell them it's my mother and my grandmother. Uh, talking about one of our core values, respect for womanhood, that's my favorite core value because the three most important people to me in my life is my daughter, my wife, and my mother. Uh, so teaching young men to value and respect um, womanhood is important, but uh, what was really important, um, and I really appreciate when mothers come and ask, how can I give my young man some support? Um, because as good of a job my mother did, she really couldn't, you know, she could only take me so far as, as you know, being a young man. Um, at some point, I stopped, you know, listening, and that's how I got connected to, you know, other things that wasn't so positive. Um, and it wasn't that my mother didn't try, it's just those other things were more enticing to me at the moment. So being able to connect them to mentors, coaches, um, and things that nature is important, reaching out to different um, men or organizations that align with what your core values or your values are at home, and just connecting them is really important. Um, so I always tell you know mothers, that is, you know, find, find men who, one, are going to hold young men accountable, but also holding themselves accountable. I'm always talking about the parallel process, right. and the parallel process is not asking of anything of someone else that you're not willing to model yourself. So when you're thinking about those men, it's really, uh, what are they doing in their lives? Because anyone can show up as a different person on social media, you know, but really do the vet, the vetting outside of that social media place and what these organizations are doing. So, uh, but I, there's definitely value add to making sure that if you have young boys that they're connected um, to, to, to men, uh, because I do believe at some point, you know, it takes a man to raise a man. But make sure that man that's involved is a man and, and doing his work of becoming a man as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll share my perspective. Um, having a father figure absolutely matters, right? And I'll tell you why. So like Brandon, my father was in my life, but he wasn't present. This man lived under the same roof as me, but he was not present, not emotionally, not in any way, shape, or form, right? He was just there to work and pay the bills, and unfortunately, in our culture, that's enough, right? But it's not enough. Um, so I find, I'm a father, I have a six-year-old, and I find that what I do a lot is subconsciously, I'm giving my son what I didn't get from my dad, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that absolutely shows me that having a father, uh, not only a father, but a present father, absolutely matters, right? Um, in, in a weird way, I don't know if you guys ever heard this, but it's like I'm healing my inner child through raising my son, right? So the things that um, my father didn't give to me emotionally, spiritually, um, you know, I'm giving it to my son and I see the difference that it makes, right? Similar to Brandon, I got to a point in my life where I questioned my dad's love for me, right? And I was like, this man is never around. Like, I can go a whole week without seeing him. He lives under the same roof as me, right? Um, and in terms of having a village, right, that matters. But I think it's our job to build that village, right? Because that village isn't gonna come knocking on the door most times, right? So we, as parents, have to, we have to construct that village around us and take inventory of who's in our lives, right? Because the people that are in our lives are gonna affect our children, right? So if you know great men, maybe uncles, you K Verdian? I know, are you K Verdian? I know you got a lot of uncles and cousins. Right, so you know what I mean. Like, reach out. Um, if you know good men, you know, reach out. There's tons of programs out there, right, that can help too. But 
I think the biggest thing is really taking inventory of who are in our lives because at the end of the day, it's going to trickle down to our kids and how is that affecting them, you know? So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have questions? Yes, go um, I was just wondering, how can men address their egos? Because it's very detrimental to their mental health. I like that question. Yes. <laughs> I think at, uh, at some point we all have egos. Mm -hmm. Like it might be healthy, unhealthy, but there's a couple of things that we need to address. Probably like I like these four words: power, control, mm -hmm. respect, and appreciation. And I think if we live by those four words, I think we can probably address the ego part. But we all have some type of ego. Like we just need to discipline it. If it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what you said. Yeah. Hey, oh, check your ego. I know you got something else for it. <laughs> no, I think um, you know, that's right. We all we all have egos. Um, egos can be good. Egos can be you know bad. Like for me, um, it's how you're using it. Like for me, I think back how my ego has helped me as an athlete. Like to be honest, ego has helped me to be where I am. Right. Um, so how do I use it for good? Uh, but also not using it as a, a power over whether that's, again, I'm going to speak to my experiences, my wife, and things of that nature. It's, it's how do you <laughs> one that goes back to knowing yourself, that goes back to your shadow. Like, so for me, it's, is this shadow present when I'm talking about my ego? Uh, because my wife will say, you know, sometimes in conversation um, or when we're having, like, is that your ego? You know, because we have that relationship now, she's able to call that and I'm able to know and then make a decision, okay, yeah. You're right. So just being being mindful of what it what it is and then what is the strategy that you use when the ego is present to whether suppress that. Um, but I also see that, you know, ego can be a healthy thing in ways just how you how do you use it? Um, so acknowledging it, understanding it, it's when you don't acknowledge that, you know, you have ego, it can become problematic for you because it's like it's not it's not that's not I don't know what you're talking about. But owning it, being able to know when it's present. Um, and how do you how do you address that in certain situations? So. Nope, don't be shy. I apologize. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Sheree uh, Charles. I'm sure you the alone. I'm African, so the name is really long, <laughs> and I won't bore you with that. Um, but I come from an African culture and one of the things that I noticed being in this country is that ego gets a bad rap mm -hmm. because it's caught up in um, ego by definition is basically your idea and understanding of your self-importance and your self-worth mm -hmm. and the reason why most people have a negative connotation with ego in my opinion is we look at ego um, and think of it as um, self selfishness. We look at ego as self-serving. We look at ego as um, negative um, uh, in the sense that it shows up, but it's actually supposed to help us. Ego is about how you view and value yourself as a person. So when I came into this country, one of the things that I noticed a lot, I'm, ve I'm a very proud African. Anyone who knows me is like, African guy, you know, because I, I even have people who can't pronounce my name, just call me Africa, you know, call me Kenya, whatever. Um, and that comes from the affirmation that I received, not only from my father, but from the culture itself as who I am and my sense of identity. So when you come and you meet, I have so many African American friends, Haitian friends, Hibernian friends, people that I've known. And I come and meet them and they told me, I'm still trying to figure out who I am because I grew up without nobody affirming me or telling me who I am. So when that ego starts to come out, it comes off as defensive because I've had to fight all my life. It comes off as, as, as a protection mechanism because people have been hurting me and rejecting me when women have rejected me or, or, or played me. It comes off as, 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 as a black man living in a country where you're not fully accepted, you're having images that are, ta that, that are tainting who you are and who you're meant to be. 
um, it comes off as 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 people holding your past against you just because you were incarcerated, just because you know you you are not able to afford or pay your child support or or, or meet your obligations or or get into relationships before you are able to handle them, and it comes off differently. So so. I think it's it's an opportunity for us to start to redefine what ego really is. It's an opportunity for us to say ego means self-love and I should love myself. And a lot of us are not taught to love ourselves because we don't have people who are around us based on what I'm hearing who love themselves enough to be able to say, hey, this is who I am. This is where I come from. The culture has already been cut off through slavery, through colonialism, through so many things, the, the history is cut off. I look at people and I call them my brother, African Americans, I'm like, man, you're African just like me. They're like, I'm not African, I'm African American. I say, but I see my brother in you, and you should see your brother in me, and everything else is trying to break this connection that we have. Um, I was invited here <laughs> by chance by some of the brothers that we get, uh, that we, we get together with, I, at my church, I was um, leading the men's group, and it was full of like different people, including some white guys who would come in with Trump, make America great again, and I'm like, all right. So I stepped down from that, from the church, and I said, I want to create an environment with people who are like-minded. And we got together with some brothers who are here today who actually invited me here. And one of the things that we were able to identify, and, and I'm able to, uh, connect with is helping them see that the African experience is the African American experience, is the Caribbean experience, is the is the mulatto experience, or, or whatever it is that you might see yourself. We all want the same things, so we check our egos at the door in the sense of we don't think that we're more important than others. If you're having a hard time with a man who has a who 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 has ego issues, meaning that he's putting himself above you or he's putting um, himself above God, he's putting himself above authority, he's putting himself, a lot of that has to do with the hurt and the pain that he's probably gone through and not being affirmed as a person and having to affirm himself and defend himself from all the things that are coming at him and it's coming off in the wrong way. And with a lot of love and care and, and care with conversations and meeting with other men who will tell him, hey listen, I hear you bro, but your thought process, it's not lining up with the truth and what we know to be yeah. true. So he's like, oh, okay, uh, maybe I should change the way I'm thinking about things and maybe this is because of what I've been through. And he starts to soften up and starts to understand that people are not against him, people are more for him. And like you all said, it takes a village and having that accountability, asking other men, hey man, we're connecting, let's go have a coffee, let's talk about what's in my head and the ideas that are coming up. Let's invite another brother. That's how we ended up meeting. We meet at Panera on, 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 on Mondays at 6 p.m. I've invited Danny, and I know he's gonna come now that I've put him on the spot. But, I've been, <laughs> but I invite brothers, and this is what I say, I'm inviting you. But if you feel that your spirit, your God, your, your energy is saying this is where you need to be, come back. If you don't come back, it's okay. Because, because I've been in so many countries, so many states, and lived so many places. I know some people are there for a reason, a season, and a time. Yes. And it's okay to let people go if they're not meant to be in your life and just appreciate them for the time that they're in your life. Yes. All right, I'm not going to take over. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I have one question. Um, how has fitness helped your mental health? and your wellness. Also, how has fitness hurt your mental health and your wellness? <clears throat> um, I would say fitness really helped me. Um, being a college athlete, being able to have that kind of structure, going to the gym and releasing. Um, and then it obviously hurt me when I got hurt with basketball, and now I've kind of been struggling to get back into it. So I say that to all you trainers here. <laughs> I'm going to lean on you to get me in the gym, please. <laughs> so um, fitness has helped me really with discipline in my life. Um, I've become so much more disciplined in my complete lifestyle, um, just with what I have to do with my food, 
Um, but it also helps me with structuring my days and taking care of what I need to do. Um, it also, at times, breaks me down because I overwork myself sometimes. Sometimes I'm literally, I mean, now I'm a lot better at it, but I mean, there was a point where I was spending, I mean, Dom can tell you, I was doing almost eight hours in the gym and just abusing my body. Every two hours in the gym, abusing my body, just thinking like, I need more, I need more, I need to, I see one piece of my body that looks this way, I gotta do something, I gotta do this, and it was, it was just breaking me, and I was, I went to a, um, get some injuries, I had some in my shoulders, I had some in my knees, and it was because I was abusing, I was addicted to working out. So I mean, it has its ups and its downs, but I believe following the right path of what you should be doing in the gym has put the structure and, and the discipline to, to let me know now, you need your rest days. You need those times off. You have to listen to your body. You have to feel your body. You have to, I mean, I was going in and saying, you know what, I'm never gonna eat before the gym. Now I'm two meals in before I even touch the gym. And then I'm gonna get another meal right after. So, I mean, it gave me discipline and um, it's helped me to learn how to control things in my life. All right, um, personally, like uh, where I'm from, like I'm from Senegal, once again, like where I live is literally like three minutes away, like from the beach, really. But my brothers from Senegal see me right now, working out like crazy, going to the gym like six days a week. They're looking at me like, yo, who are you? Because back then, they want to go to the beach, walk out, they look, I'm like, nah, bro, I'm good. I'm good. So now, like, them seeing me, like, walking out, like, just doing what I'm doing for people that don't know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is very intense. It's like the goal is to try to um, break any drugs that you have in your body. That's the goal. And it's very intense and it's just go, go, go. So doing that and being in the gym like six days a week, they're looking at me like crazy. But that's my therapy. That's what really helped me like be sane. And if I'm in the gym, like I just forget any everything. Like I'm just I'm saying it's been helping me in a crazy way. I'm back home, like I can spend time with my kids. Even though yeah, sometimes I'll be thinking like outside the gym, thinking about the gym, but it's been helping me like, you know, be a better version of myself. I'll go next. Um, so I'm, I'm sure everyone can agree with this, right? Like, going to the gym is a journey, right? And it's up and down. Um, for me, it is at least. It's up and down, right? But I think when I'm at my best, it's when I'm most consistent in the gym, right? And which that's the healthy part, right? Because it helps, like George said, with discipline. It helps with so many things in my life, right? But I think we've all been there where we use the gym for the wrong reasons. For example, after a breakup, don't nobody go harder in the gym than somebody who just came like, out of a relationship, right? They, they're going hard, right? Because you want to stunt on the ex, right? And I think when the, motivation, when the motivation is not for self and it's for others, that's when it's unhealthy, right? Because how can you stay consistent when you're not even doing it for yourself, right? So I think you know the gym can be used absolutely for, for good things. Um, and I think... Being in the gym has to be a part of everybody's life, right? Um, regardless of how many times you go, two times a week, eight hours a day, whatever, whatever works for you, right? But I think um, the motivation has to be healthy, right? It has to be for self and not for others. Leave that ex alone, they're gone, let them go. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I gotta say, um, the gym, it helped me a lot. Like I'm talking about, when it comes to discipline, that's like a one for me. Like it's to a point where like um, one of my friends, he's here, he's here right now. He was like, man, like your discipline is through the roof. It's it's crazy. And um, he was like, you know, if you can apply it to other parts in your life, it it will you will be in a whole nother level. So I was like, okay, yeah, definitely. So you know, um, one, it was like I think it was like. Two years ago, about a year ago, I started this like fast journey. It was just more for my belief. Uh, it's more me just fasting, praying, and uh, reading. So I don't eat for like seven days, you know. So I took that discipline that I had, that 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 mindset that I had, and I took it and use it in other parts of my life, like um, you know, work. You know, when it came to you know families and relationships and and all that other stuff. So, you know, fitness really helped me a lot. Now, I think the downside of it, but because I'll, I'm always training, I'm always on the go, and I'm always having that tunnel vision, it, it kind of 
destroy me when it comes to relationships because I would take too much time mm -hmm. training, 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 not giving my family enough time to be there, uh, um, you know, emotionally, you know, there physically and all that stuff. So the gym is really good. I think it helps me with a lot with my discipline. It helps me with my mind. You know, like I said, it helps me to express myself. But also, you know, I realize that you kind of have to have a balance too outside of the gym. You know, so, but yeah. Who's next? I don't know if uh, you didn't tell me we all had to be like fitness buffs <laughs> over here. <laughs> I just went to the gym to record you, man. <laughs> but I will uh, give you a quick story. So in high school, when I played, kind of, they, uh, I went to Severian Bre <laughs> Brothers High School. And in Massachusetts, it's illegal to have more than two sessions a day. So they brought us to New Hampshire. Three sessions a day, and then film. Zavarian was, that was, it was different. It was different. But one common denominator, I would say, created a brotherhood, because we all struggled. And that's the one thing when you guys were in the gym, and I see, you know, your IG and his IG over here, and Marco as well. It's a community. It's a brotherhood. And a sisterhood as well. So I would say... That's the part that's amazing. Um, as I had mentioned before, I did go to San Diego to just hang out with my cousin who had lost his child. And um, we were just hanging out late at night. He said, hey, do you want to go to the gym? I said, sure. What time? He said, five. <laughs> we're waking up. I said, okay. <laughs> I'll go and I'll just act like I'm doing something. Didn't know what I was signing up for. He's like, hey, you got to sign on. And I'm like, who goes to the gym to sign in? So I, I filled out the information and it was a hit gym. Oh. Yeah, That's different. very different. Yeah. 530. So I got to sleep Ooh. 20 minutes on the ride. So I got there and I think this is to go back to the ego where the ego helps. I didn't want to embarrass myself. So 49 year old self said, I got to keep going. So as I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And then we got the, I think it was 30 seconds interval to before you go to the next yep. session or whatever, we're doing that. And I'll never forget that there was um, this box and there was this uh, older lady that got on her bigger box. And I was like, where's the small one? But I started to do that. And then my ego kicked in and I said, hey, I'm going to do it. And I started doing it. But the bad part is I pulled my hamstring. So, so that's the bad part. Um, but I want you guys to know I did sign up. I am going, I'm back to the gym. I'm not doing like, I'm not doing an eight hour thing over here. But I will say that it helps me simply selfishly because as an older man and Haitian man, and this is again, if you guys need a physician, 745 River Street, High Park Health Associates, your testosterone tends to go down. And then you get to become very lazy and tired and procrastinate more than I usually do. But when you exercise, it actually helps, like a lot. So gentlemen, if you're in your 35, coming to 40, get ready, because it's coming, I'm telling you, okay? So tell your significant other it's not that you're not fancying them as much as you used to, or whatever the case may be. It's just that the, I got to 200, you know, then that's low. You're supposed to be like 300 and up. So talk about vulnerability. But, hey man, but I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> shout outs to my doctor. And shout outs to the gym. <laughs> I just close, I mean, everyone has said it. I want to touch on the, um, the ego part because, um, again, that's always in us. And yesterday I was at the gym. We have a group of us, right? So I show up to the gym late. They've already, they're about an hour in. Um, and oh, we're at the gym, they're on four plates, right? In my mind, I'm like, Sean, don't start at four plates. Right? <laughs> Stop, blow them up, blow them up. Um, Sean starts at four plates. I'm failing it today. Um, I felt it during the workout, but that's the ego thing. It's like, yep. we, we got a bunch of monsters in the gym, you have to make, you know, our crew that Dom connected us with. So I show up in the gym, you got Frank going off. I'm like, I gotta go off now. <laughs> Ego. Um, so, but no, the gym has been my safe haven. Um, you know, for me, leading national organizations, um, it can be a lot. It can be a lot. I tell people sometimes leadership is lonely. Um, leader, leadership is lonely. And that's why these relationships and these conversations are important because who am I, um, who am I talking to when I need support? Uh, because I'm the one that everybody comes to. Um, that's my family. That's work related. Like I'm the patriarch. So everyone comes to me. Who does Sean go to when he needs? Too. So the gym for me um, is an opportunity just to get away, free my mind, be connected for three hours, 
um, how it's also impacted is what others said, relationships. Um, it was a conversation that I had to have with my wife. She said, let's sit down and I'll check in. This, you know, came up. Um, so I had to be mindful of how much time I was putting in and not taking away from home and things of that nature. But it also helps in terms of building healthy relationships and, 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 and um, finding new bonds, building new bonds, building brotherhood and a sisterhood and things of that nature. Because I've never, I would have never come across this queen and be in this space if it wasn't for the gym, if it wasn't for Dom. So, you know, those are the, the perks of, of, of being in the gym. Um, and with that, I am out. Let me just, let me just say I was just gonna say one, one thing uh, about what Danny was saying about, because I, you know, I, I do train. Um, I've been actually been working out for just to say I just been working out, been working out for 14 years now, and um, um, just throughout my journey, just training, training with people, especially with men like guys who I talk to, you know, they they tell me all the time like. Um, when it comes to the reason why they worked out was for a female, you know. <laughs> Some of them laughing because they know. Uh, but um, um, I tell guys like you know, guys who come in and they worked out because of a female, whether what type of situation it was, maybe it was a bad breakup or. You know, she told the guy that he needed to work out, he needed to you know, get his body right. And I tell guys, like, yeah, utilize that as fuel, right? But just don't stop there. That tool that you have, utilize it to um, inspire somebody else. Because what I tend to find out some guys, when they get to that point, they got the body, they got everything that they got. And then it gets to a point where it's just like, okay, where do you go from here? You know what I mean? So I tell guys all the time, when they get to that point, you know, utilize that tool, that's, that, that fuel, use that, utilize that as something positive so you can go ahead and help other people. So, but yeah. I just want to leave with this note, right? Um, get therapy, right? Um, and again, another stigma is that you get therapy when you're at rock bottom. No, you get therapy now, right? You don't wait until you have a terminal illness to go get a checkup. You do that every year. Therapy has changed my life, and I'm open about it. I'll tell anybody and everybody I'm in therapy, right? And now you add that with the gym, that's, that's a lethal combination, right? Because the gym is helping you physically, mentally as well, but you need to release everything that's going on, right? You need to unpack it and deal with everything that has gone on in your life to this point. And therapy does that, right? So. I'm encouraging everyone in here, men, women, indifferent, whatever, get therapy, seek therapy. And it's available, it's out there. So don't feel like you're gonna get you know, judged or anything like that. Um, you're doing yourself and your future self a huge favor by getting therapy. We are at time. Got questions? Okay. No, I'm just gonna piggyback on what he said. And I just I I I wasn't going to say anything. Um first of all I'm lost for words because first of all I think it takes great transparency and strength for every one of you to be here and to share your stories and to be transparent. Um, this is not common, but it should be. It should be. Um, so I commend each one of you. Um, Sean, I am elated to hear about your relationship with your wife. I'm gonna try to do this without tears. I was married for 30 years to my best friend. I lost him the day after our 30th anniversary. I grew up in a, in a home that it was taboo to have these type of conversations. A man is not supposed to cry. Um, the first time I saw my husband cry was when he asked me to marry him. 
the second time was when I walked down the aisle. We made it a point to teach our children that it is okay to cry. It is an emotion. So I commend the fact that you and your wife are at that point that you are best friends. I do believe that everyone gets a soulmate. Everyone doesn't meet, necessarily meet their soulmate, but I do believe everyone gets one. And I was blessed to have one. You all give me hope. There actually is good men out there for my daughter. <laughs> um, but the fact, this, please don't let this stop here. Please don't let this stop here. Um, I think this was a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, my sister. Um, and I would love to see this grow even more. Um, to the women, <laughs> I say this humbly and respectfully. We have to do better by our men. We're not the only ones that suffer. They suffer in silence, too. We have to give the space and the place to be open to hear what they have to say and to be a support system for them. To you, my sister, hear my heart. Men, boys, need men in their life. Because there are some things we can't teach them. And my husband, we used to argue all the time. And he's like, no, I need you to teach him what you're teaching, but I'm trying to raise a man too. Because there's just some things you can't teach him. And so, yes, my sons had their father, but we also made sure that there were other positive role, men role models mm -hmm. that exhibit what we wanted our children to have. Yeah. So sometimes our children can't come to us as mother and father because sometimes they can't hear it, mm -hmm. but to surround them with positive people that you feel comfortable that they can talk to mm -hmm. because we're not it. So we do need a village. The village isn't there now. I don't, I don't have all the answers, but this is a start. This is a start. So again, I commend every last one of you for just your transparency, because I know that is huge. We don't see that. We don't see that. And I do believe women, just like we suffer in silence and we think we're supposed to be it for everyone, Men were raised the same way that they're supposed to be it. They're the man of the house, and, and but they have feelings too. Mm -hmm. And they go through just as much as we do, and we need to be as supportive to them as they are supportive to us. So I commend every last one of you again. So thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to close this you know, discussion and panel and yes it will not stop here this is just the beginning of something great yes. and i know that we all are going to connect we all are going to do wonderful work and i just wanted to bring our community and different individuals just to hear our stories and, and and sometimes you feel alone but you're not alone and we all in this and we have to hold each other accountable we have to practice what we preach right and we just have to give people space and just give people grace, most importantly. I think we all need some form of grace in our lives because we all are struggling with something. We are all walking in different shoes. Thank you so much for everyone.